Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone, members, officers and members of the public to this meeting of the Planning Control Committee. Before we start, I'd like to invite the committee member and scrutiny officer to conduct a roll call of those joining remotely. Thank you, Chair. Um, Andrew Hunter? Yes, here. Perfect. Over to you, Chair. And that's it. Okay, um, item one, apologies for absence. Apologies for absence have been received from councillors Val Bryant and Morgan Derbyshire. And having given due notice, councillor Nigel Mason will be substituting for councillor Val Bryant and councillor Michael Muir will be substituting for councillor Morgan Derbyshire. Do we have any further apologies? Councillor Bloxham. Yeah, I've got uh, apologies from Ian Moody. Item two, minutes from the meeting of the 13th of October 2022. I propose that we take as read and approve the minutes of the meeting on the 13th of October 2022 as a true record of proceedings. Can I have a seconder, please? I attended the committee as a sub, and yet I'm not on the councillor's present list. Thank you, Councillor Muir. And were you a Councillor Muir beat me to it by a nanosecond at the same point sub as well we, we I think we're both listed I think we're both listed under the apologies section but not on the present section let me just take that as an amendment okay we'll just amend the minutes accordingly thank you that's okay okay that being said can we oh sorry Councillor Allen Happy to second with the amended uh, but amendments as said. Thank you, Daniel. Okay, so can we go to the vote then, James, please, on that? Um, Chair, that's carried with amendments. Thank you. Uh, moving on, item four, Chair's announcements. One, recording. In accordance with Council policy, this meeting is being audio recorded as well as filmed. The audio recordings will be available to view on mod.gov and the film recording via the NHDC YouTube channel. Now, at this point, I have to um, just inform you that we're having a small technical problem with the cameras in the chamber um, and they, they're they unable to cover everybody uh, in the room. Um, so if you are speaking, um, normally you'd be visible on the screen, but that may not be the case this evening. You might be out of shot, but your name as a speaker will still be um, shown on the screen. OK, so I hope that's um, that's OK. Uh, number two, declarations of interest. Members are reminded to make declarations of in interest before an item. The detailed reminder about this and speaking rights is set out under Chair's announcements on the agenda. Number three, to clarify matters for registered speakers, members of the public have five minutes for each group of speakers, supporters and objectors. There's a separate five minute time limit allocated to member advocates. A warning will be given at four minutes to alert you that you have one minute left. At five minutes, you will be advised that the time allowed has ended and the speaker must cease, cease to speak. I've allowed, um, I've agreed to allow 10 minutes for each group of speakers on item six, land to the north and east of Great Wymondley in Hertfordshire. And fourthly, comfort break. I will aim to um, take a short comfort break around 9 p.m. or at a suitable break in the proceedings. Item five, public participation. Can I confirm that the registered speakers are in attendance? Parish Councillor Paul Harding. Caroline McDonnell. Hugh Chatfield. Derek Carter. Councillor Richard Fake. Phil Roden. Tim Lee. Thank you. Uh, Parish Councillor Neil Burns. 
Nicky Tribble, Peter Calver, and Councillor Lisa Nash. Thank you very much. Now we move to item uh, six on the agenda, application 21 slash 03380 slash FP, land to the north and east of Great Wine, Midley, Hertfordshire. Sean Greaves to present. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I do have uh, some updates. Um, firstly, um, I'm pointing out some uh, typographical corrections in the report. And these are um, at 4.1.6, references made to conduit heat at Priory Farm, and that should read conduit head. Um, at 4.6.24, references made to appellant, and this should read applicant. And finally, at uh, 4.6.27, uh, the year 2030 should read 2040. As members will be aware, uh, the North Hertfordshire Local Plan 2011 to 2031 was adopted by full council on the 8th of November. Um, and this report was written before uh, that adoption, and therefore there's references to the uh, now um, superseded local plan. Uh, and there's references to this matter um, at paragraphs 2.6, 4.5.4, and 4.5.42 of the report. Uh, references are made to policies of the emerging local plan in the report, and significant weight is given to these in the report. As the local plan is now adopted, uh, these policies now uh, are attributed full weight, uh, the planning balance is not materially affected, and the officer recommendation is unchanged. The save policies of the previous local plan referred to in the report are now replaced by policies of the new local plan. So uh, the site is still located uh, within the green belt and references made to saved policy two of the superseded local plan. This is replaced by policy SP5 of the new local plan that refers to green belts and uh, land beyond the green belt. Therefore, where stated, where it's stated at paragraph 4.5.43 that the starting point for consideration of this application is saved policy two, this is now uh, the starting point is now policy SP5 of the new local plan. It's been brought to my attention by Councillor Levitt that a page is missing from, was missing from the glint and glare assessment that was on the Council's uh, website. Uh, this is within the section addressing aviation considerations, albeit the full document was available on our internal system. Uh, the, do the document, including the missing page, is now available on the Council's website. Uh, the submitted glint and glare assessment by Pager Power undertakes a high level assessment. Uh, the nearest main airport is Luton Airport, uh, and this is 11 kilometres to the southwest of the application site. It's best practice to consider reflections towards pilots in the last two miles of final approach to the airport. And of course, the application site is well beyond that. Um, and with regards to air traffic con control, proximity, close proximity to the aerodromes is a, is a, is a consideration. Uh, given the distance uh, involved, officers do not consider that this proposal would have significant impacts on aviation. Uh, the glint and glare effects upon highway users have been carefully considered by the highway authority who have raised no objections to the proposal. And finally, with regards to drainage, um, we've received a late response from the lead local flood authority and the response and note has been circulated to members. Um, as set out in the note, the LLFA is, are not raising an in principle objection to the proposal, and whilst they have concerns relating to the proposed drainage strategy, these relate to matters that can be addressed and controlled by condition. Therefore, two additional conditions are proposed by the LFA to replace condition seven set out in the agenda. The officer recommendation remains that permission is resolved to be granted subject to referral to the sector of state for levelling up housing communities and conditions set out in the agenda as amended by the notes that has been circulated to you. So I'd just like to start my presentation. So if I could have the first slide, please. Uh, this is a location plan uh, of the, the site. Um, the red line, uh, there's a red line that goes along the road through to um, the bottom left-hand corner of that plan, and that's uh, the route 
uh, of the uh, cable that would go from the solar farm to uh, Wymondley uh, substation. Uh, the application site uh, is located to the east and northeast of Great Wymondley, to both sides of Gravely Lane, which runs down, down the middle. Uh, to the east is the A1M, uh, with the village of Gravely beyond uh, that motorway. The Hertfordshire Way uh, runs along the east and northern boundaries of the northern part of the site. Um, the application uh, site extends to 88 hectares, including the route of the cable. Um, and, uh, prior, and this cable route runs along uh, Gravely Lane and Priory Road, um, through to the, uh, as I said before, to the substation. Um, the area over which the solar panels are proposed uh, to be positioned extends to about 85 hectares. Next slide, please. This is the general arrangement of the solar panels, uh, and uh, this shows the rows of photo 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 photovoltaic panels in blue and these areas shown in yellow. Um, and I'll explain the difference between the blue and the yellow shortly. Uh, the panels were placed on, on a frame and posts uh, that are inserted into the ground. Uh, the yellow areas are areas where geophysical um, surveys have identified potential archaeological interest. And in those areas, uh, the, um, the frame would not be uh, inserted into the ground, it would be placed on rafts so that there's no digging within the areas where there's potential archaeological interest. Um, there will be uh, trial trenching uh, proposed in a submitted uh, written scheme of investigation th throughout the site, but mainly concentrated on those yellow areas. And that would uh, that trial trenching would occur pre-commencement if you were reminded to a uh, ground planning commission. There are internal roads or tracks within the site, along which there are inverter and transformer stations and battery storage containers located. Uh, stock and deer, fenced, deer, or deer fencing will be uh, around the site. Next slide, please. Uh, this shows the landscape proposals and there's various, uh, it shows existing and proposed landscaping. There, there will be hedgerow planting, tree planting and uh, low maintenance pasture around the panels uh, beyond the deer stock fencing. Uh, the areas around the, the solar panels are proposed to be grazed by sheep. Um, and uh, the stock fencing uh, where, and beyond the stock fencing, between that and the boundary, there will be species rich grassland. Uh, details are required and would be controlled by suggested conditions. Uh, drainage is shown on, on there. Um, it's very difficult to see, but these areas are blue, and there will be attenuation bonds and detention basins um, to serve the proposed de uh, development. Uh, next slide, please. This is the first photograph of a, of a set of photographs, and this shows a photograph from the Hertfordshire Way, and this is taken towards the east of the site. To the left, where that post and rail fencing is, is the site, and to the right, you can probably just make out the A1M, and this is looking north. Uh, next slide, please. This is a photograph further along uh, Artfordshire Way to the north of the north end of the site, and we're looking west. Uh, so to the left of the site is the site where the photovoltaic panels would be uh, located, and to the right uh, is uh, open, open fields that would remain as such. Um, additional uh, hedge planting uh, would, would fill in all those gaps uh, a lot along uh, the, that left-hand side of the, the uh, Artfordshire Way. Uh, next, next slide, please. This is a further photograph looking across uh, towards uh, Great Wyman and Leaf from the Artfordshire Way and across the fields uh, where the solar farm is proposed. Uh, this was obviously I've taken the photographs where the gaps are in the hedgerow rather than you show you a photograph of a hedge. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this uh, photograph uh, is taken from Gravely Lane, and we're looking northwest through a gap in the hedgerow. Uh, next slide, please. 
This is uh, also a view from Gravely Lane. That's looking um, northwest, uh, and uh, the corner southern half is looking towards Stevenage. That's looking uh, across uh, the southern part of the site for, from um, Gravely Lane. Next slide, please. This is a drawing of the solar panels on the frame. You can see uh, the angle and uh, there's, there's two types that I mentioned before. There's the ones where uh, the frames will be inserted into the ground, piled into the ground. And then there's the other type in the areas where there's potential archaeological interests that are placed on, on a raft. Next slide, please. Um, this um, is a drawing of inverter transformer station. There'd be 22 of these uh, around the site, uh, located at various points um, next to the internal access tracks. Uh, next slide, please. These are similar looking uh, containers that would ho ho house the battery storage. Um, and there are 22 of these around the site, again located alongside the internal tracks. Next slide, please. Uh, this is details of the stock fencing that I mentioned earlier, which would go around the site. There would be a gap between the hedgerow and this stock fencing of about 12 metres, within which uh, there would be uh, species rich uh, grassland. Um, and uh, there's a elevation showing the proposed CCD fee poles, which would be around the site for security purposes. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a typical cross section of a cable trench, which would go all the way along the road um, th through Little Wymondley uh, and to Wymondley substation. Um, ex excavation of the cable trench would be done on a daily basis um, and back and uh, laid and then backfilled so that there's no uh, large areas of spoil, which was an issue that the Environment Agency wanted to make sure happened so that uh, there wouldn't be... Um, large uh, spoil areas that would affect potentially affect the uh, the capacity of 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 the area to uh, accommodate water in the event of flooding um next slide please and uh, these these are drawings of proposed passing place and entrances during construction um the Accesses uh, would be uh, designed during construction to accommodate uh, larger vehicles, um, and um, those would that that passing place and uh, access would be reinstated. Uh, would not be necessary the passing place during the operational part of the site after it's constructed, um, because uh, the traffic generator will be very m minimal, probably similar to the existing agricultural use when it is an operational solar farm. So uh, this is an application for a solar farm within the countryside and the green belt. There are complex technical aspects to the proposal that you don't find in more common types of applications, such as housing. I am aware that the applicant has a professional representation and members may wish to take the opportunity to ob obtain clarification on any matters that is raised by him. As indicated at the beginning, um, if you resolve of the report, that is, um, that you've seen, if you resolve to grant planning permission on this application, it must, because it's in the green belt and of a certain size, it must be referred to the Secretary of State for levelling up communities and housing. You can call in the application for his determination. However, if you resolve to refuse the application, the matter would not need to be referred to the Secretary of State. The proposal is inappropriate uh, development within the green belt. While certain forms of development uh, are identified in the MPPF as not inappropriate in the green belt, such as mineral extraction, renewable energy is uh, not one of those exceptions and is uh, considered inappropriate development in the green belt. The applicant, however, has put forward a case that there are material considerations or benefits that constitute very special circumstances that clearly outweigh the harm to the green belt by reason of inappropriateness and any other harm. Uh, the report addresses the impacts of the development on the openness of the green belt and its purposes and concludes that there would be significant harm to openness and moderate harm to one of the purposes of the green belt, namely to assist the safeguarding the countryside from encroachment. I should point out um, that this is not 
a proposal for housing or commercial development, of course. But uh, the structures, as you've seen from, from the um, drawings, are comparatively lightweight, albeit they extend over quite a large area. Um, and the solar panels would be approximately three metres in height. In terms of visual impact and landscape character impacts, there are, these are addressed in the report. We appointed a landscape consultant to appraise the submitted landscape and visual impact assessment, and the scheme has been amended to respond to that appraisal. There would be impacts upon the raw character and purpose of the area from the proposed development. This is inevitable given the scale and nature of the proposal. The harm, however, is localised, but in terms, of the site, in terms of the site and the immediate area, the impact would be significant. Uh, the site lies within the setting of several heritage assets, and these are addressed in detail in the report. Uh, heritage England were consulted on the proposal, who considered that there would be less than substantial harm to the significance of nearby designated heritage assets. And given the limited intervisibility, raised no objection to the proposal. The site is good quality agricultural land. However, livestock grazing would continue on the site whilst it's being used as a solar farm. And also the proposal would not be permanent. It is 40 years, which is a relatively long period of time. But after that uh, 40 year period, the proposal would, the site would return to full agricultural use with the enhanced biodiversity that is proposed as part of this scheme. The benefits of the scheme are set out in the report. The main benefits set out by the applicants relate to renewable energy generation in relation to climate change and achieving the legally binding target of net zero carbon emissions by 2050. That's the UK uh, target. Um, the, the proposal would provide significant amount of renewable energy, which to put it in context, would meet the energy needs of around 12,000 homes, which is comparable to the housing allocation in the new local plan. In terms of urgent local need, the Council declared a climate change emergency in May 2019, and the strategy associated with that seeks to achieve net zero carbon emissions in the district by 2040. That's 10 years earlier than the UK um, target. The amount uh, of energy generated from renewable energy sources in the district currently is relatively modest. And I set out in the report two existing um, solar farms within, within the district, one adjacent to Luton Airport, which is in, in our area, and another near Reed. Those are relatively small at five hectares each and generate around about five megawatts uh, output maximum. In terms of need for a greenbelt location, such facilities are dependent upon access to the national grid. Uh, the proposal is about four kilometres from Wymondley Wy substation, which is one of the reasons why the applicant uh, cho chose this location. Uh, the issue of solar curtailment is a technical matter, but basically it uh, affects the location of solar farms, um, where uh, and solar curtailment is the deliberate reduction in output to balance supply due to lim limitations in power lines and storage. Um, you can uh, address that by increasing the number of power lines and storage, but that can often be quite expensive. Uh, it is often more uh, cost effective to basically purposely reduce the uh, uh, transmission of uh, energy compared to carrying out those uh, structural works. Um, there will be economic benefits during construction and from the delivery of additional renewable energy. Uh, there will be net gains in biodiversity um, and uh, there will be uh, lim limited benefits in terms of uh, um, betterment in terms of uh, the drainage strategy which seeks to reduce uh, dra drainage uh, emissions during, during peak flows. So on balance, officers consider, the, consider that there are very special circumstances that uh, clearly outweigh the harm to the Greenbelt and any other harm. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Sean. Uh, do members have any questions for our officer? I've got Councillor Muir. Right. Thank you. Uh, I have four questions. First of all, the CCTV cameras, uh, can their height be lowered so they're less visible? Um, at the northern end of the site, can more planting be done because the panels will be facing south 
Uh, so if there's more planting on the north, they won't interfere uh, with uh, uh, the, the panels. Um, after 40 years, if they want to continue with a solar farm, well, they have to apply for planning permission again. <coughs> and fourth question, what community grants can be made to the local parish councils? Gosty. With regards to the uh, first uh, uh, question, um, what is proposed is um, CCTV cameras atop four meter high poles. Uh, the matter can be raised with the applicant um, in, in future negotiations with regards to the details of uh, the scheme. Um, and um, uh, that, that's a matter that can be raised with them at, uh, during the conditional discharge stage. Uh, with regards to landscaping, um, a basic uh, landscaping scheme um, st strategy has been submitted, but uh, landscaping is uh, subject to conditions, and that matter can be looked at further at the conditional stage. Um, sorry, what was your third question? Oh, yes. Um, whether it's replacing certain elements, yep. would they need planning permission again? They, they would. Uh, there is a condition imposed on 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 this uh, uh, proposed uh, that would require the decommissioning of this site, um, and um, it, they would need to comply with those conditions. If they were to want to uh, carry on or uh, erect a new solar farm or whatever we have in forty years' time, um, they would need a further planning permission. And. And finally, uh, with regards to community grants, that isn't a matter for ourselves to consider. There, there's no basis really from the local planning authority's viewpoint to require uh, financial contributions or community grants. That's outside the rules set out in the uh, community infrastructure levy regulations and set out in the framework. However, I am aware that an offer has been made uh, to the parish council from the applicant with regards to um, some grant to the to the parish council um, but um, I've not been being involved in that matter because it's um, not something that we can require as part of any section 106 agreement thank you thank you I've got um, councillor Levitt next David thank you uh, that you've classed this as a temporary structure where although it's being there going to be there for 40 years now, 40 years is the normal life of a building. If you're building an office building, that's the normal expected lifespan. I, uh, so 40 years is not really temporary. And what is there anything to stop after that 40 years, anybody claiming it's been previously developed land? Sentence, sorry. Yeah, uh, after, after being there 40 years, which is quite a time, um, could it not be uh, classed as previously developed land? And be a permanent loss to the green belt because of that. It, it would be classed as previously developed land once uh, planning permission is granted, but there are conditions requiring its decommissioning and uh, return to full agricultural use. But obviously, agricultural use would continue on the site in the form of uh, stock stock grazing. Um, Forty years is a, a long period of time, and I've addressed this in, this matter in detail and given that matter limited weight accordingly. Um, I wouldn't say that 40 years is temporary. However, it is a material consideration that it's also not permanent and that after 40 years, it would uh, re re revert back to full agricultural use. Um, and um, there are conditions requiring that to be to be the case. So when you're considering matters such as effect upon the green belt, there would be a, an effect, uh, an effect on, on the green belt over a period of 40 years, which is a relative long period of time but it wouldn't be a permanent um, effect upon the green belt. And the same goes with uh, best and most versatile agricultural land. Obviously, the site would continue in agricultural use, albeit in a, in a lower form in, form of, in the form of uh, grazing compared to arable production. But once again, after the 40 years, it would be able to return to arable production because the nature of the proposal means that it can. If we were proposing housing, of course, or commercial units on the site, it would never 
uh, be revert back to uh, agricultural use and it wouldn't be appropriate to impose conditions requiring that to be the case because you'd be granting planning permission for permanent development. Councillor Levitt, does that answer your question? Thank you. Um, I've got Nigel, Councillor Nigel Mason. Thank you. Um, uh, two questions, both similar themes to a couple of um, Councillor Mule's questions. The first one, Councillor Mule mentioned what happens after 40 years. I was just concerned about what would happen rather sooner if um, I don't, I can't imagine we'll decide we don't need solar panel anytime soon but should that happen or should this particular facility fail or should the come whoever's running it go bust or whatever else anything there, there, there's some sort of vague reassurance in here about what would happen i was just wondering how much certainty would we have that land would be restored I'm basically worried about the option if it, if it didn't work for some reason we'd end up with a failed solar farm taking up part of our countryside that was one question. And the second um, was, is there is there no way in which some immediate benefit could be given to the local community? Um, this may be simplistic, in which case I apologise, but um, a, a block, a large block of flats has been built in the ward I represent. And as part of that, solar panels have been put on the roof and those solar panels will be used, I'm delighted to say, will be used for the benefit of the people who live in the block of flats. Uh, is there any way in which some arrangement could be made for the local community who haven't put up with a blight on their countryside um, to benefit from the energy that's therefore produced there? Uh, obviously, there are many solar farms uh, around the country, and that's a risk with all of these uh, solar farms that the company in charge of them may well um, go into administration or whatever. But that would be the asset of that company, and in, in, in all likelihood, it most likely would uh, be uh, a new company would come along and, and purchase that asset. Um, the conditions, uh, planning permission goes with the land rather than with the applicant. Uh, so the planning permission would be, would be for the benefit of the land itself. Um, and uh, the conditions would still apply. That would require after 40 years, um, the decomm decommissioning of the solar farm and its restoration to um, uh, full agricultural use. That could happen sooner if, if for example, uh, technology changes or there's a change in, in circumstances that we're not aware of at this point in time. Um, with regards to the uh, uh, contribution uh, towards the community, uh, there is no there is no me means of us requiring that on, under this proposal. Unlike housing development, which would have, for example, impacts upon education and other matters, uh, and the contributions sought would be to mitigate those impacts, uh, there's no, in my view, uh, or in the view of the officers, there is no such uh, justification here, and any requirement for such contributions would not meet the tests that are set out in the community infrastructure levy regulations which is a statutory requirement um, that is not to say that uh, an applicant cannot unilaterally unilaterally offer such uh, uh, benefits or contributions towards the local community and that does happen for example with wind farms um, and, and uh, i understand that an offer i have seen a letter that is from the applicant to the parish council that has made an offer and the applicant may uh, is speaking later may want well want to um, uh, address that matter okay okay i got um councillor willoughby next Alistair. thank you chair um I know we uh, we mentioned uh, a couple of times now that uh, what happens in the intervening years uh, uh, from the year zero to the year forty, um, because you, you've you've as you pointed out, it, it now will be previously developed land. Assuming that it, uh, assuming that it did go ahead, that would be the case. Um, could they midway through the forty years decide that they want to change the use? um and and put it and put it in for something else entirely um and could they in fact get a, an extension on that 40 years with, through planning um before the 40 years end and therefore not ever have to return it to um agricultural use uh, yes, very 
they could. But they'd have to apply for planning permission, and it would be totally within the control of the local planning authority at that point. Okay, and um, Councillor Allen, Daniel. Sorry to keep on with the point on the 40 years. Um, this one should be a bit quicker. Who was it who suggested the 40 year time scale? Was it ourselves or was it the um, developers? It was the uh, applicant who proposed 40 years. Um, there, there have been solar farms earlier on uh, that proposed 25 year life, and that was based upon the technology and the systems in place at that point. Um, the uh, so I've, I've been doing research on this matter, and solar farms these days, um, the technology is different, the infrastructure is different, and and they can last 40 years now, um, and that's why they apply for that uh, period of time. It's not unique uh, in terms of the application here. As, uh, that's what uh, applicants apply for on all the solar farms around the country. Does that answer your question, Daniel? Thank you. Um, Sean, I may have a question, actually. I just wanted to go over the argument again about how the um, this fits in with the council's own net zero targets and whether the the council has got a responsibility to deliver energy, renewable energy to its residents, um, or whether this is something over which we really have no control. It's just a private matter between an applicant and a, a company, and whether any of the renewable energy finds its way into North Hertfordshire anyway at the end of the day, and just not the national grid in some sort of bigger scheme of things. Uh, with regards to uh, the county, the council's uh, declaration, um, we have uh, made that declaration uh, that we will achieve uh, carbon zero by 2040. In order to be able to achieve that target, uh, there would need to be a significant increase in renewable energy generation. But that's only a part of the equation. There are lots of things that will need to be done within the district. Uh, in a relatively short period of time, we've set a target that's 10 years sooner than the national target um, in order to achieve that net zero. Um, the district at the moment generates a very small amount compar compared to the country as a whole in terms of renewable energy. Um, the figures indicated are that uh, renewable energy generation in the district is around 10%. And nationally, we 40% of our energy is generated by renewable sources. So we're, we are behind in that regard. Um, so if, if the district is to achieve net carbon zero, renewable energy generation is part of, 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 will be required to be increased to achieve that target, along with many, many other things. So it's only part of it. Uh, sorry, what was your second question? Um, Chair. It was related to the same idea that right. does the, I mean, the renewable energy that's generated, how, how is that actually offset against North Hearts Council? Right. It, um, it would obviously link energy. into the sub substation at, uh, at uh, Little Wymondley, the Wymondley substation, which serves this area. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other members have a question for? the officer, in which case um, we'll go to our registered speakers. As I mentioned before, um, I've allowed uh, 10 minutes per group of speakers. So we'll come to the um, a group of objectors. There's four of you, and hopefully you've had a chance to divvy up the time and work out who's going to say what and when. So um, when you start, the timer will begin, and I'll give you a warning at uh, minute nine when you've got a, a minute left um uh on your time okay so um if you'd like to just introduce yourself and uh begin your presentation please good evening my name's derek carter i'm a member of the wymondley neighborhood plan group and i've lived in great wymondley for 48 years i wish to focus on two key areas the protection of our green belt and maintaining food production on high quality agricultural land. <clears throat> My first point relates to the retention of the green belt as open country and to stop the coalescence between Stevenage and North Hearts towns and villages. It was decided at 
a council meeting last week to approve the local plan as, and as a result take large areas out of the green belt so that they can be developed for housing. After that reluctant vote, it was inconceivable that just one week later we are faced with a vote that could remove another 200 acres of green belt. In the Wymondley Neighbourhood Plan, which went through the full statutory process and this council ratified, it emphatically states the parish view for retaining the green belt. It's been stated that the Stolar development is not permanent as it will be decommissioned. However, your planning officers have provided case law that confirms that land use for development for 25 years must be accepted as lost to the green belt. This solar array is planned for 40 years, as we're aware. My second key, uh, key point relates to the arable land that will be lost to grain production. The AGR Commission report states, and I quote, this site comprises gently undulating land and fundamentally offers no restrictions to agricultural use and cropping potential, unquote. The site is grade two, uh, sorry, the site is grain, pro grain producing grade two and three A agricultural land and should be used for food production at a time when clearly food security is paramount in the nation's lives. The developers put forward establishing a flower rich field margins around the perimeter of the site to increase biodiversity. But this is already good farm management and is widely practiced with food crops. It's not a special attribute, attribute to solar arrays. There is a strong presumption in the national framework against developing solar on grade two and three A land. I can see no evidence that alternatives have been exhausted to prove special circumstances. I believe the concept of using grade two land is without precedent and should not be contemplated. To conclude, there are better places to produce energy than using grade two and three A land that should be kept in arable production. I urge the members to reject this application. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Hugh Chatfield. I'm 27 and my partner and I moved to Great Wymondley where my grandparents lived before me last year. I highlight three points today urging the committee strongly to reject. Firstly, I ask the committee to reflect on the plan's nature and disproportionate scale with which there will, quoting the planning notes and comments made earlier this evening, inevitably be landscape harm. The array to be four times the village's size with four metre fencing and CCTV will be ugly and intrusive. It will thoroughly damage the area's rural character, ruin views for neighbours from my house and from local footpaths I regularly use throughout my adult life. Plans also show my house will be affected by notable glint and glare not raised in this evening's presentation. Such an industrial development on the green belt would have stopped us moving to the village last year. Secondly, I urge the committee to request more work on the plan's fire and noise risks. Solar array fires are increasingly frequent, yet the plan has no input from the fire and rescue service, despite likely being against recommended procedures in the building regulations. Is the committee satisfied? I am not that a fire engine could easily maneuver on site. Plans do include a fire suppressant in the battery containers we saw earlier. This is, however, deceptive. My partner, a fire safety engineer, spoke with a manufacturer of the gas suppressant. The company conferred their suppressant would be ineffective in the coast of most fires, including from batteries overheating. Battery fires trigger vents in the units which release the suppressants to the atmosphere. This is also polluting and potentially toxic. Furthermore, no consideration has been given to the risk of panels amplifying motorway noise uh, to nearby villages. I fear a similar experience to Stevenage residents who are suffering from a wall in Todd's Green constructed without, like this plan, an independent assessment of noise deflection. Thirdly, I'm worried about disruption during construction. Access roads for the site and my home suffer traffic in excess of their capacity already. Up to 160 HGV trips a day, as proposed, for almost a year will be crippling as minor roads are dug up for extensive cabling. The plan represents colossal, uncompensated disruption to neighbours and myself. I champion renewable energy and support technology like rooftop solar and wind, in part to protect the countryside, the very plan, the very land this plan will damage. I urge the committee to reject. Good evening, my name is Caroline MacDonald and I'm a resident of Great Wymondley for the past 17 years. I'm outgoing chair of the Wymondley Community Garden and current church warden of the Grade 1 listed St Mary's Church, Great Wymondley. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm here to highlight why the application should be rejected. 
The proposed site of the solar farm is an area of natural beauty with deer, badgers, hares, red kites, barn owls and a wide variety of small birds and adjoins an important conservation area. The footpaths, including the Hertfordshire Way, are frequently used by runners, dog walkers, D of E participants and ramblers, both local and from our surrounding towns, as well as those who need to commune with nature to support their mental health. The charity Mind supports spending time in green spaces as a benefit to both your mental and physical well-being. Residents are committed to increasing the biodiversity and ecology of the area with the introduction of a community garden, the wilding of sections of St Mary's Churchyard and the encouragement of wildflowers on the community orchard. We actively participate in the Big Garden Birdwatch and Big Butterfly Count to ensure we encourage a rise in numbers. Site construction will result in the destruction of wildlife habitat established over centuries and the loss of access to significant archaeological heritage, as well as the highlighted disruption to residents. The impact of the solar farm will result in the industrialization of an important natural area with a massive loss of land which will significantly change the character of the countryside. The CCTV, transformers, battery containers, over seven kilometers of fencing and other supporting infrastructure will negatively impact the view from footpaths. The planting that is proposed will take over a decade to establish and will not hide the infrastructure from current residents. The scale of the solar farm will also contribute to bridging the gap between Gravely and Great Wymondley. The North Hertfordshire District Council has an opportunity to become leaders in non-harmful renewable energy practices, which could set the trend for councils throughout Britain and other countries to follow. We strongly oppose the application and urge the committee to do the same for the benefit of the environment and the community. Thank you. And finally, good evening. I'm Paul Harding, a member of Wamley Parish Council. Solar power is targeted to be 8% of Britain's overall carbon neutral energy policy by 2050. Cutting edge technology is being introduced in the sector with the development of lightweight solar film to increase roof usage, movable panels and much more efficient panels that can deliver the target whilst limiting loss of open countryside and BMV land. If latest technology panels were used in this case, the 150,000 would produce over 70 megawatts, um, and, and, and that is over 30% more than the applicant would be allowed. So is the scheme actually 30% larger than it need be, or are the panels inefficient? Reviewing other sites, this is the biggest land take to produce 50 um, megawatts by some way. As scale, is a key objective. This is very important, but nowhere do we see the developers' proposals on this and many other points, such as the lack of alternative sites, being checked and verified by your officers, and it is critical that they are. So have these very special circumstances that have to be proven to develop on Grade 2 and 3A Greenbelt land been achieved? We've reviewed your officers' assessments of benefits and harm and would say resoundingly, no, they have not. Specifically, the overall effect on Greenbelt surely has to be very substantial. Certainly felt listening last week to councillors' views on that. And as Derek has said, the loss of agriculture, to say that is moderate. Just one minute left fails to understand the whole drive by government to protect grade two and three a land for arable production. It must be very substantial. And three points considered neutral by your officers, uh, as mentioned already, noise, fire and highway safety surely have to be considered a, a moderate risk at least. So in conclusion, I urge the committee to listen to the local community and take pride in being innovators for solutions, as Caroline has said, that protect our environment, maintain our arable production, and are further future-proofed to 2050 and beyond. Solving one problem by creating another is no solution at all. We urge the committee to reject this Greenbelt high-quality land application, as others, such as Basingstoke, have done with Bramley Firth Solar Farm, 
and in your fast track local plan review, build a structured approach for the long term future of renewable energy in the district with your council, not the developers in control. Thank, Thank you very much. Um, do members have any points of clarification for the speakers? Yes, Daniel. Um, thank you very much for all of those words. Um, one of the questions I have is regarding the fire safety. Um, I'd like to know which company it is that have said that they aren't able to supply that to make sure that if this does go ahead, they're not used. Which company did you um, speak with who've said that they couldn't supply safe um, and effective chemicals to stop fires within those um, uh, containers so that's not used if it does go ahead? So I myself did not speak with the company. I can follow up to the committee afterwards if that's appropriate with the name of the company. I'm not sure if they are the company providing the specific suppressant to be used in this site, but they are another manufacturer of this suppressant. The suppressant is named Novec, and then it's followed with a particular number. I can't remember the number off the top of my head. Um, the chemical itself does stop fire. However, it's not designed to stop the type of fire um, that would be caused by a battery overheating and thermal discharge in those instances. Just to follow that up, um, that's the kind of suppressant that would be used in the jewellery industry that I used to work in, um, which definitely isn't the type of thing that you would have in there. You would have something specific. So saying that that's not efficient, I can't see is actually relevant to the conversation that we're having right now. Thank you. That wasn't a point for clarification, however. Thank you. Um, I've got no more uh, speakers, uh, uh, members asking for points of clarification. So we'll move on to our next speaker, and that is um, Councillor Fake, uh, who is speaking as a member advocate. And, and uh, may I thank the local member for consenting to allow me to appear. Um, I'm the County Councillor for Nebworth and Codicut and also Priory Ward and Hitchin. Can I first say that I do not envy the Development Control Committee or Planning Committee, nor the officers advising them uh, in, in uh, shall we say, weighing this particular uh, problem. The fact of the matter is the Council has declared a climate emergency and clearly we would very much like to collectively contribute to a, a change in, in uh, for, away from carbon fuels. But the planning process is in place to not only protect and control, but to, to limit any damage that might be caused uh, for the communities in which they live. We've heard some very erudite um, um, presentations, and I will add nothing more in terms of new information other than to say uh, that over a number of years, in fact, very nearly 20 years, uh, I have been involved in the local plan process, uh, both at uh, when it was the East of England Regional Assembly and subsequently uh, when it came closer to home. And time and time again, our uh, professional officers have given us advice as members when we're dealing with all these con development control issues on the weights that must be applied to emerging government policy. A clear and unambiguous statement recently by the current administration, who knows when, whether we'll get another one very quickly, well, I don't, but the current <laughs> administration has said that, that grade two land and good quality grade 3A land is not where they want to see these developments. And I have to suggest that the officers perhaps have failed to give the weight in this particular case that they ought to, and that I would have hoped that, that they would have done. There's another issue, Chairman, um, that is essentially the claim that, that, that this will continue in agricultural use. We've heard that before all over the place. I've yet to see a sheep wandering um, around the base of these, uh, these arrays, but uh, it could happen, so I'm not going to be too pedantic about it. But I say to you, the removal of, uh, of, of, of arable land capable of producing high quality cereals and foodstuffs for the possibility of grazing is something that I find very difficult to swallow and think, frankly, again, insufficient weight has been given. And last but not least, Chairman, it, the, the question of decommissioning. I have serious doubts and have had for a long, long time about the industry 
in general, not this particular applicant, because they're no better or worse than the industry as a whole, in terms of being honest with us uh, about the true economic, uh, true environmental impact of producing these arrays, that is physically manufacturing the, the panels, putting them in place, running them and decommissioning them. We've heard that there is going to be a condition to decommission, but let's put it bluntly, 40 years on, we've got no control whatsoever over the capacity of whoever then is running that array or owning that array to have the financial clout so to, to decommission it in a safe and sensible way and to deprive uh, Greenbelt land forever with something that perhaps the wider public purse has got to pick up to decommission when we have no way of knowing how uh, environmentally dangerous this stuff will be in 40 years time when it's no longer of value in producing uh, low cost energy or green energy is something that I can't accept. And therefore, if you are minded to, to pass this uh, members, I would really hope that you will find a mechanism to get some form of bond or some form of insurance to decommission this, because frankly, if you don't, I think in 40 years time, you could leave future iterations of this authority and the wider population of Wymondy and the villages around there with a real problem. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Richard. Do um, members have any points of clarification for Councillor Fake? No. In that case, we'll move to our next two speakers who are speaking in support of the application. Um, and we'll also be sharing a 10 minute speaking slot. So uh, we've got Mr. Roden and Mr. Lee. I don't know who wants to go first. I think it's probably just going to be me because I take a full 10 minutes. So Is that OK? Yes. OK, that's fine then. Please continue. Unless I managed to get it through very quickly and then. <laughs> uh, so I'm Phil Roden, I'm planning consultant. I'm joined by uh, Luke Rogers of AGR. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening and for Mr. Greaves' presentation, setting out the key planning issues and planning balance in reaching his recommendation for approval. As I said before, North Hertfordshire declared a climate change emergency in 2019 and have committed to becoming a net zero district by 2040. In response to this declaration and national renewable energy targets, AGR have developed primary Priory Farm Solar Array with the aim of supplying clean renewable energy. The key locational criteria for any social solar farm is the availability of a grid connection point with sufficient capacity. Existing connection capacity in the UK and North Hertfordshire is extremely limited. Recently, National Grid have stated that they will need to build seven times as much infrastructure in the next seven or eight years than they've built in the last 32. This is to support the move to a net zero electricity system by 2035. This is a major investment programme and renewable energy developers are now having to wait six to 10 years to connect new developments. In contrast, the Priory Farm Solar Array can connect in 2024 and help decarbonise the electricity network well in advance of 20, the 2035 national target. As stated, the pl main planning constraint is the site's Greenbelt location. 38% of the total area of North Hertfordshire is allocated as Greenbelt, and the proposed site represents just over 0.6% of this Greenbelt land. The lack of available grid connection points and the extensive nature of the Greenbelt, combined with areas of high landscape quality outside the Greenbelt, have led to renewable energy developments coming forward near the available grid connection points, which are in the Greenbelt. Um, the applicant's initial site search prioritised identifying land outside the Greenbelt to minimise their planning risk. Um, however, no other unconstrained viable sites could be secured and no alternative unconstrained grid connection points were available. National planning policy does not preclude energy development in the Greenbelt, and there are numerous examples where renewable energy developments have been approved in the Greenbelt based on very special circumstances associated with national need and the climate change emergency. The key Greenbelt consideration is the need to balance the very special circumstances against the harm. This planning balance exercise is set out in section 4.7 of the committee report and clearly concludes that the very special circumstances put forward outweigh the harm to the Greenbelt in this instance. I would just like to expand on a few of the very special circumstances to emphasise the importance of this project in delivering net zero and the wider environmental benefits that flow from this. 
The UK government is committed to net zero by 2050, with the interim target of a net zero electricity system by 2035. The British Energy Security Strategy sets out that a five-fold increase in solar energy is required from where we are today. In advance of the recent COP27 conference, Rishi Sunak said, we need to move further and faster to transition to renewable energy. And I will ensure the UK is at the forefront of this global movement as a en clean energy superpower. These sentiments are aligned with your climate change strategy, a key pillar of this being the council committing to supporting both businesses and residents to switch to renewable energy. Despite this commitment, only 10.4% of energy generation within the authority was from renewable sources in 2019 when the climate change uh, emergency was announced. The authority haven't consented any new commercial scale renewable energy projects since declaring the climate change emergency. The solar farm would occupy only 0.2% of the district, yet it would be able to supply almost 32% of the households in North Hertfordshire. This represents a very significant contribution to the energy needs of the district and would move the authority a considerable way to becoming a net zero carbon district by 2040. This is correctly given very, very substantial weight in the planning balance set out on pages 70 to 72 of the committee report. We're all experiencing spiraling energy costs as part of the current energy crisis. And this is the main driver for the current high inflation levels and cost of living crisis. The solar farm electricity generation would be delivered at a lower levelized cost than any other generation technology, and this will contribute significantly to reducing energy costs to consumers as renewables displace more expensive fossil fuel generation in the energy mix. The applicant is also in discussions with energy supply partners to offer reduced tariffs to local communities when the solar farm is operational. These discussions are at an early stage, but is something that is currently being piloted with communities in proximity to wind farms. The applicant presented the project proposals at an open meeting arranged by the Parish Council via Zoom in January. In combination with statutory consultee responses, this resulted in refinements to the pro proposals, including removal of areas of solar panels, provision of additional woodland and hedgerow planting to enhance screening, increased buffers to hedgerows and neighbouring footpath with, a, with increased wildflower areas for greater biodiversity gains, identification of no dig areas to preserve archaeology in situ, and provision of permissive footpaths to provide circular routes and enhance public access to the area. Whilst correctly pointed out by Mr Greaves, not a material planning consideration, the applicant has offered a community benefit fund of £20,000 per year for the full 40-year life of the project, giving a total of £800,000 to be used on local community environmental initiatives in recognition of the localised effects of the development. The applicant proposes to have further dialogue with the parish council and local community should planning permission be granted, and this would inform the construction phase and additional mitigation measures that may come out of those discussions. Um, we recognise that there has been um, flooding events to the south of the site in recent years, and that this has been linked to water catchments that include the application site. Research has proven that solar farms do not increase significantly surface water runoff, particularly if the areas below the solar panels are well, ve well vegetated with grassland. Um, however, a robust drainage strategy has been prepared, the overall effect of which would be to reduce peak runoff in the one in 30 year flood event by 30% compared to the current situation before development. This is a significant betterment over the current situation and reduces the likelihood of future flood events. As set out earlier, the details of the surface water management at the site can be secured through a suitably worded condition and development would not proceed until this has been agreed with the lead local flood authority. The applicant is committed to continuing agricultural activities within the solar farm through sheep grazing and the site would be restored to full agricultural use following decommissioning. The UK is a food secure country and the biggest threat to food production and farm viability is the current energy crisis and climate change impacts. The proposed development would address both of these key pressures while supporting the existing farm business through diversification. The planning committee report sets out a clear and balanced consideration of the key planning environment and environmental issues. Your experienced planning officer has undertaken a very careful and considered balancing exercise and has concluded that there are material considerations that weigh heavily in favour of the application. Taken together, these represent very special circumstances that clearly outweigh the harm to the Greenbelt. As such, the proposals are considered sustainable development and should be granted planning permission. And I think we've got... <laughs>
two minutes 30 if you'd like to is it on no right You know, the clock stopped, yeah, I noticed that. So I don't have to rush there. Okay, now it's working. Hi, I'm Tim Lee. I am uh, a member of the Green Party and was uh, asked to represent uh, the discussions as we have had discussions about what we, what our position should be on this matter. And we share quite a lot of your concerns. However, overall, we feel that it is a necessary thing to go ahead because of all the things that have been discussed around uh, the climate emergency and the changes that are going ahead. I point out that I'm also currently studying a master's in marine renewable energy because there is probably going to be a future where we don't need this. So I hope that in 40 years time, maybe even less, it becomes unnecessary because the amount of energy that we, is available to us in the sea is incredible. It's the scale of if you could capture one hour of the energy from the sea, you could power the UK for a year. But sometimes it's just too much. The concerns we have in particular about this site are around the biodiversity. And we would hope that that plan is made more exacting one more minute and uh the uh, there are other better plans that could be happening but this can go ahead in the time scales that uh the applicant has talked about which is a very important matter and will provide that bridging of uh power in a renewable manner uh, in the time scales that we need it to happen. And the final thing I'd say is that there is an opportunity here for the uh, using regenerative agricultural practices for the soil condition to be rebuilt in a way that does not happen with the traditional farming that we have around, where soil is steadily being damaged by artificial fertilizers. If you want to know more about that, a green a groundswell uh, in Western uh, is an expert on that. Thank you very much. Um, now, at this point, I'm going to ask if uh, members have got any points of clarification for the speakers. And just to remind you that um, if you've got any sort of very technical questions, uh, I think Mr. Greaves would be delighted if you put them to Mr. Roden um, in the initial instance, who's probably more qualified to provide an answer on a, um, a technical question such as um, my question which is going to be about solar curtailment and what does that mean so we'll start with that if that's okay yeah so curtailment is when there, there isn't the capacity within the grid to receive renewable energy or any energy, energy coming in so quite often you might see it when you see a wind farm and there's three of the turbines are spinning and three of them aren't and that's because um, I, I live near one in Frodsham is there isn't the capacity to, it's, it's an oversupply and that's linked into the fact that there's, there's a shortage of storage on the the national grid and the distribution network and that's another um, part of these solar farm projects is we're including battery storage and it's it's the types of projects I'm working across all across the country is to increase storage capacity so that renewable energy that would otherwise go to waste because of curtailment can actually be maximized because there's sufficient storage to accommodate it to then supply it back to the grid when it's actually needed okay. so the big criticism behind wind farms and other renewable energy story historically has been that it's not necessarily develop generating power at the time that it's needed and it has been the backup has been gas fired or gas fired power stations or gas peaking plants the system now is you know the solar farm has its own battery storage elements to it which will smooth that flow and deliver power when it's needed to the local area and to the local grid and national grid are investing significant well, national grid aren't the private sector is investing significantly in storage projects to facilitate the maximize 
maximizing the use of renewable okay. energy across the country. Can I just ask a, a follow up to that, which was um, just about the, the 50 megawatts. Um, does that therefore mean that there's, there's no need to cap it? it? It just, I mean, could could you exceed that amount of production? The, and the limit on production, in... the limit on supply is the actual, there is a 50 megawatt grid connection. So that's offer. Finite. That's that's the maximum that can be fed into the grid at any one time. Okay. Because that's the limitation of the the capacity that's available at the substation. So AGR have secured a 50 megawatt grid connection capacity point, and those those are planned in years ahead. Um, and so there's a commit. The connection date is 2024. So you know the planning process builds into that, and that's what the applications come forward quite in advance of the connection timescale. Thank you very much. Now I've got um, Councillor Mason, Nigel. Thank you. Um, I, we've heard quite a lot, but clearly that there is undoubtedly pain involved if, if, if this goes ahead. And I'm trying to get my head around the gain. Um, I've been scouring the, 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 the report for some sort of less technical, more uh, layperson um, um, definition of what sort of level of energy this, this, this um, would bring in. Um, I, I think I think the speaker mentioned I saw 32 percent of households. I just wondered if someone could expand on that because I'm just trying to get my head around. As I say, I can see where the pain's coming from, and I'm just trying to un understand how significant an energy, a clean energy producer, this would be in terms that doesn't involve megawatts, please. Doesn't involve megawatts. I think the uh, representative can, can answer that. It's a point of clarification. It, it is something that uh, Mr. Rodham mentioned earlier. Yeah. Uh, necessary, I can add to that uh, a, a, a later date. Mr. Rodham? Yeah, so um, I think in Mr. Greaves' presentation, he talked about 12,000 households. Now, that's based on the, the maximum um, energy consumption per household. Whereas we've looked at it based, they, the Ofgem have brought out new figures and they measure things differently. And so we've looked at the the average, which is the, 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 the low low user, the high user. So we've looked at the medium use. The average household in the UK uses 2,900 kilowatt hours a year. Um, in North Hertfordshire, there is... Um, what have we got? We've got... Um, so the, effectively, the, the, the solar farm will generate 51,494 kilowatt hours. Um, using the figures, that's 17,756 households worth of electricity, which is the 32% of all of the households in North Hertfordshire. Their, their annual usage so the the annual uses if and these are all averages so this so 2900 kilowatt hours is the average usage of a household in the uk and it varies ac across the country and it varies if you're a five bedroom house or a two bedroom house so we've used the the, the medium which is the the, the the central figure that's provided by Ofgem, and they update that every year and the power produced by the solar farm would supply 32% of the households of North Hertfordshire on an annual basis. Now, obviously, there's, there's fluctuations due to weather conditions, but that's that is the the sort of type of the quantum of of benefit I think that we're we're talking about. Does that answer your question, Nigel? Thank you. Um, Councillor Willoughby, Alistair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Roden, um, I've got some questions here, so <laughs> I'll uh, I'll go through them. I'm, I'm I'm trying not to take too long. Um, it has been mentioned um, forty years is quite a long time. Uh, technology moves quite quickly these days. Um, how you keep up with more efficient solar tech, and does that mean that there's potential that uh, a large overhaul of at the site could take place at any point in that 40 years that will cause a similar level of disruption um over you know at some point or you know maybe at more than one point um shall i ask all my questions in one um chair or 
Would you like no, to? I'll be lenient on that, Alistair. We'll do one at a time. <laughs> I can take that one and thank Sorry. you for your question. Um, excuse me, I'm aware that you're a registered speaker. I'm oh, sorry, I introduced Luke at the beginning from AGR. That's a no-go. Oh, that's no-go. I don't believe he's registered to speak, so okay. unfortunately... That's fine, I'm sorry, I apologise for that. Um, so in terms of... Um, there's, there's a 40-year lifetime for the actual panels, and you know, panels, they lose a little bit of efficiency in the first couple of years, but then they maintain through, and that's sort of come through in a lot of the research and the solar farms that have progressed um there may be the need to replace some of the battery cells in the battery units because they have a, a shorter life period um but in terms of significant replacement of all the panels during the 40-year lifetime that that wouldn't happen Alistair. thank you um okay uh so my, my second question out of three i, I promise it's only three um so uh, I, you're planning to have uh, sheep grazing. Are there more efficient ways that you looked at um, for food production, uh, other types of agriculture? Because I, I noticed that according to the uh, diagram, it's quite low to the ground. And I've seen quite a few uh, of these solar farms that have crops growing underneath them. Is that something that could have been considered? Is there a more Is there more efficient ways or is it that you went with sheep because it's easy? Um, no, we, we went with we, we go with sheep because it's tried and tested technique. AGR have um, history with farmers in East Cambridgeshire where they graze sheep on, on all of their um, solar farms. And agri solar isn't particularly common in the UK. It's it's being explored and trialled in, in in European countries, but it 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 does it does it's a much larger land use requirement for the same generation. And there are various different alternatives. You have to space the rows of panels wider so you can get agricultural machinery in between the rows. So it's, whilst yes, it's technically feasible, it's not something that we've explored in the UK. I'm not aware of any agri-solar schemes there. Thank you very much. Alistair, last one. Last question. <clears throat> uh, you mentioned the uh, money, uh, 20,000 for the uh, uh, each year for the uh, 40 years. And uh, you also mentioned a cheaper power supply, potentially. Um, I assume that those haven't been fully agreed. And certainly we can't put conditions, I don't believe, on that. So I don't know necessarily that mentioning them uh, is is almost uh, very, it's quite convincing. But at the same time, in, unless that's guaranteed, um, that's quite difficult. So how close are you to um, moving towards an agreement on that local money? And uh how stringently will you actually move forward with uh, the uh, idea of having the cheap power supply uh for locals there's an offer has already been made to the parish council in writing from agr for that community benefit fund the reduced power that's part of an ongoing discussion that so there's there's an energy supplier already that runs a pilot scheme called fan club where um if people sign up to their tariff they get reduced power when the, the wind's blowing now that hasn't been developed through to solar yet but i we know that it is something there they are exploring and it depends on who agr work, work, they are working with them on other sites and on this site and it just depends how that works through so i just mentioned it because it's it's something that the industry is looking at and i know the local mp is is, is, is interested in some of those community benefits coming back to to, to local people through reduced energy costs, but it's not something we can commit to at the minute. We've committed to the community benefit fund, and that's that will have to be worked through. So, if planning permission was granted into a form of unilateral undertaking or legal agreement with between AGR and the, and the parish council, um, but that would be there for you know, like environmental improvements, whether that's um, biodiversity gains or providing a renewable energy fund for people to to embrace renewable energy on their own homes there's, there's, the, the, it, it wouldn't necessarily be limited in terms of how the, it'd be for the parish council to decide how they wanted to use that that money over the the life of the project thank you um i've got councillor levitt next david thank you chair i've also got three questions which i'll take one at a time uh the, the first one is um fairly easy one 
or hope it's fairly easy on, why 40 years instead of the normal industry standard 25 years? Um, well, technology has moved on and schemes, you, well, the, the solar farms aren't subsidised anymore. And 25 years was really linked into when, when I was working on was, was wind turbines for 25 years. All of the solar farms I've worked on over the last five or six years have all been 40 years because of the level of investment that's required because it's no longer subsidized. It trades with every other form of generation and manufacturers guarantee 40 years for the panels. Whereas older technology, the guarantees, the warranties were less. Uh, second question is, it uh, says in the report, it will produce a reduction of 20,000 tonnes, cubic tonnes of CO2 emissions. Uh, over what period is that 20,000 tonne re uh, reduction? And combined with that, as part of the same question, how many tonnes, how many cubic tonnes of CO2 is, is required to produce 160,000 solar cells, move them around the world, install them and build the infrastructure? Yeah, so the, the in terms of the panels, the carbon payback is, is six to ten years in terms of for the carbon that's embedded into the production, the transportation and the delivery. In terms of the, the, um, the first question, so could you just remind what the first question just yeah over what period is that twenty thousand tons of emissions going to be oh so i mean the, the twenty thousand tons is is comparing solar farm generation to gas generation and i believe it's an annual saving based on the kilowatt hours that would be produced by the solar farm compared to the the, the co2 that would be emitted from gas generation at a, for a comparable amount of power that, thanks for that, but we're not. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, the third question. Um, you said you've secured a 50 megawatt connection to the grid. And I believe somewhere in what answer one of the other questions, you, there's something about the capacity is 57 and a half um, megawatts. The requirement. In the report, it says it's 49.995, so it's 0 0.005 megawatts under what is required for it to go to the Secretary of State. However, you've, you've quite clearly said this is, is, a, is a 50 megawatt link, and you can produce more. So it might, this might even be a question for our legal officers. Why are we seeing this as this? And why is it not a significant infrastructure product? Because it's actually meeting those criteria, and you've just said that yourself. Uh, no, but what I said it was it's a fifty. Well, it's over fifty megawatts is the DCO threshold. Um, we actually have a forty nine point nine nine five megawatt connection offer with National Grid. Um, the figure I quoted before was a sort of capacity factor figure, which is from the software calculations, but the actual grid connection capacity is below the DCO threshold. Is that okay, David? Can I, yeah, can I just clarify that? Go on. The, the requirement is if a, if, the requirement is if, if, a, if an installation is capable of generating a, over 50 megawatts, it requires that. Yours is capable of generating it. You may only have that connection, but you are you have you are capable of generating more for them one hundred and sixty thousand arrays, aren't you? Yeah, no, it's the the inverter capacity is restricts the supply of power to the to the grid, and it's the inverter the inverter capacity cannot export more than fifty megawatts of of power. Right, it, the DCO threshold is over 50 megawatts. We actually can only export 49.995. Yeah. Yeah, One last go. Yes. Well, this is the question. That I'm yeah. Whether there is actually a, a how, a limit how many that. megawatts? If you put the extra infrastructure in place later, how many megawatts could those one hundred and sixty thousand panels generate? If it, it's well, no, it's it's subject to the grid connection that we have. 
we only have a 49.995 megawatt grid connection offer. So it's how much generation? Okay, I think we're going to have to leave it leave it there for, for now on that. And uh, if the if the connection is limited to that amount of power, then whether this is um, afraid not. Um, okay, I've got um, Councillor Hunter next. Tony. Thank you, Chairman. Um, one of my questions has just been um, sort of answered, uh, reference to DCO. Um, the other thing that was implied somewhere in the applicant's presentation that was renewable energy, if it doesn't go ahead, is going to affect agriculture. I couldn't quite get my head around that one. I wonder if you could explain it to me. It was really the point that um, the biggest threat to agriculture is the energy current energy crisis and the effects of climate change. There are lots of farmers who are, are, are leaving farming because of their energy costs have gone through the roof. And it's in the news at the minute in terms of the egg farming industry. But also crop production is significantly impacted by climate change. And that, that's the point I was trying to make is that those are the two biggest threats to agricultural production, not the loss of agricultural land for a period of 40 years that would then be returned to full agricultural use and natural england who are the statutory consultees for loss of agricultural land have not objected to the loss of this particular site and the this all the solar farms that i've worked on and have been consented in east cambridgeshire are all on best and most versatile agricultural land and natural england have accepted and actually in their consultation responses have reflected the fact that this allows the soils to recover for the 40 year life of the project, particularly where they've been intensively farmed for a long period of time. It allows the soil structure to return and it actually improves the farmland over time. Be that it does take it out of cereal production for the life of the solar farm. Thank you. Okay, and finally, I've got Councillor Alan Daniel. Um, just one more question around the 20,000 um, pounds a year that has been um, suggested. Um, how will you be held to account for supplying that over the period of time? And what would happen if, for example, um, the parish council was dissolved, which could happen with a change of boundaries, etc.? I think that would have to just be, form part of the discussions, the initial legal agreement. So there is a fallback position of the funding going to the next administrative boundary area so i think you'd have to build in mechanism there'd have to be a period of of, of legal discussions and i'm sure agr would help sort of fund the, the parish council's legal representatives to to enter into those negotiations so that there is something that's secure and will maintain that funding for the life of the the, the project whatever the, the changes to the boundary and administrative administrative areas might be thank you okay moving on then um it says in my notes there's an opportunity for Mr. Greaves to respond to any points raised, which I'm sure he'd be delighted to do. Yes, um, the, the point I'd like to make is related to the last matter that was discussed. Um, I said earlier that um, I've not given any weight to any financial contributions that have been offered to the parish council. Um, because um, any such contribution would not meet the tests set out in the SIL regulations. Um, the, the, these uh, tests are, are there in order to ensure uh, that uh, there's, there's no um, question of planning permission being bought uh, and sold. And um, members should not also not give that matter any weight in their assessment and their decision making today, because uh, that would leave the decision open to challenge on the basis that uh, the council could be challenged on uh, of having uh, of the application being bought or the decision being bought in relation to the application. So I must uh, make that clear that that is not a matter that I've given any weight and it's and I advise members not to give it any weight either. Okay, um, so members, we now come to the debate. Who would like to start? Councillor Levitt. I'll, I'll, I'll start. I, I came here to, before I started hearing this tonight, I came here with a really 
thinking I was going to have a really difficult decision because it is providing a lot of renewable en energy. Uh, and it, it's weighing that up against the green belt. What's what's the best? Is it's, it's it's that decision. It's a subjective decision, really. It is inappropriate development in the green belt. We know that your report says that it is. It is a loss of green belt, which we've only just redefined, which is part of the local plan. It does. Now we've heard tonight make it previously developed land. So it could be open to the forms of development in the future. The reduction in of, of carbon, 20,000 tonnes, I thought was good, but that's compared to a gas one. But we're not having a gas generating thing. So we don't know that we're saving 20,000 tonnes because we're not gen we're, we're, there's not, no proposals to generate it any other way at the moment. We've just seen today size of LCs going ahead with enough to provide six million homes. Um, the other thing I was really concerned about was the impact on the landscape. I had the, uh, the my other one was about the uh, glean and the and reflections, which I had answered, and I'm happy with that answer. But the other impact thing is I, members hopefully will have seen um, earlier on, I sent some aerial pictures around that are done from Google Maps and superimposed the size of the site on there. And it is huge compared to what's around in it. And it does take a massive amount of the area, which is quite open rolling countryside. You can see it from the greenway when you walk or cycle across there. Um, and now we've had this thing that the capacity is greater. Is does the do the very special circumstances outweigh the, the, the green belt arguments? Actually, I think this there's, there's there's they don't now. I th I was in two months, and I'm absolutely certain in, in my mind now that the size of it, the impact on the landscape, the potential for it to generate more than it that than it we, we're talking about here, and the fact that really. And I think from what I've just heard, it, it should be going to the Secretary of State. It shouldn't be for, for us. It should be going as a national infrastructure project because it is capable of gener generating more. Um, and although I appreciate what it will do for the green energy thing, I don't think the very special circumstances are proven here. And again, yes, it is subjective. So, Chair, I'm going, I'm going to actually move that we refuse the application. On those grounds, that it that it's very special circumstances are not met. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, is there anyone who would like to second Councillor Levitt's proposal to refuse the application, with reasons for doing so? Councillor Tyler. Are you able to expand on your reasons or are you in agreement that there's not the very special circumstances that outweigh the harm? Yes, I think with the, particularly with the green belt that we just removed um, by the local plan and or the refining, I, I don't think the, uh, the, the, um, the question of uh, the, the solar farm taking out more green belt uh, is justified in this case. Thank you very much. I've still got um, people requesting to speak. Uh, next, we've got uh, Councillor Allen. Daniel. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to disagree with Councillor Levitt. Um, I'm very much of the opinion um, that this is something that is needed. We have declared a climate emergency. Green energy is the way forward, and this is the right thing. As far as Greenbelt land, I voted against the local plan. However, I also read the local plan, and I'm aware we are making more Greenbelt in North Hertfordshire with the local plan. So losing 0.86 of an amount of it is not ideal, but is not the end of the world. Now, I can understand the people that live close by it not liking that. 
I do understand that completely. But I also understand that come the future, we need green energy. Now, saying about the amount of energy being produced compared to the amount of energy that's going to go into the grid, with solar, I'm studying to be an electrical engineer at the moment, with solar, you do have more energy created than you can put through at different times because it's all relative to the amount of power coming from the sky, the amount of sun. That's why there is more created at certain times. We need to follow through on our climate emergency status. We need to follow through on the recommendations of our planning officers who have made sure there are no legal reasons for us not to go ahead. And I do recommend that people vote against Councillor Levitt and put this through as this is something that we need in North Hertfordshire. Thank you. Um, Councillor Hunter, Tony. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, firstly, I'd like to thank our planning officer, Mr Greaves, for a very comprehensive report. I've read through it, I think, twice uh, to try and get my head around things. And th the thing is, I'm very torn with this because renewable energy versus green belt, because that's what we're basically talking about, the circumstances that we're having to consider. Um, and unfortunately, I've always been one of those individuals in planning, but I've always believed green belt is sacrosanct. Um, I can seldom think of very special circumstances that outweigh our green belt, because it is so important that we protect our landscape uh, for the future generations. So I am still in my head having MPPF grained into it, 147 and 148, is still much in my guidelines. And I'm going to sit here and think why other people talk as to which side of the fence I'm coming down on. So thank you kindly. Thank you, Tony. Uh, I've got Alistair Willoughby, Councillor Willoughby. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I have to uh, uh, agree uh, with the previous to you about how difficult this decision um is um and i, I yes i will follow through and say i you know thank everyone uh, who has spoken i think that, it, that all these points are remarkably well made points and effectively the argument at the moment is environment versus environment um and we're going we're now having to make a decision um that uh, is very difficult and it's uh, uh we lose and we win either way but i will i i have to say that i am now i think leaning on uh the approving um uh the uh application side i think um unfortunately we are at a point um in our um history or what will be history where we have to make choices where we remove some of the green belt so that we save the green belt of the future. And I think that's uh, all I can really say on that. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Muir, Michael. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's a very difficult decision. Uh, I've always supported our green belt. And there's, I think it's 2% more green belt being uh, created in our local plan so losing this little bit uh i don't think we'll have much uh difference uh also i fly and at the end of the runway where i fly there's a solar farm on either side of the runway um it doesn't produce any glare at all under the strongest sun i fly around it twice a week uh, and fly around the local area of cambridgeshire um, where i see others and i've never seen any reflection uh, and i don't really see uh, uh, points of um points of uh where one would say that is ugly uh we shouldn't have that there um uh, so if uh councillor allen 
wishes to propose acceptance, I will willingly second it. Uh, thank you, Councillor. We've got a proposal um, on the table at the moment with a seconder um, to refuse the application. So we're going to have to vote on that um, and and take it from there for the refusal. Um, I'm informed we still need to firm up the reasons for that refusal if we, um, when we get to the vote on that. I've still got um, a request to speak uh, from Councillor Mason, Nigel. Thanks, Tom. Um, it's a horrible one, this. <laughs> um, and Councillor Hunter, I think, summed it up neatly. We're, asked, seem, we're being asked to choose between, between the green belt and renewable energy. And it's, it's, it's an odd decision. I've, I've faced this one before in quite such stark terms. Um, and I think, if I'm being honest, if, if this was anything else, if this proposal was for a warehouse or a retail park or even housing on this green belt land, I, I don't think I'd be... I think I'd have long since proposed what we did. Um, but it's not... And we sit in this council, every time I come in this council chamber, we talk about, we have an announcement about a climate emergency, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's, it's weighing heavily on my conscience that we, it appears we are being offered an opportunity uh, to do something about that climate emergency, albeit at a cost and particularly a cost for the local people. And that that's what weighs heavily, heavily on me. Um, but I, Whilst I, I recognise Councillor Levitt's um, arguments and respect them as I always respect uh, Councillor Levitt's arguments, I don't think I can go with him on this one. Thank you very much. Does anyone else wish to join in the debate? Okay, now we've got a proposer um, in Councillor Levitt to refuse the application um and we've got a seconder in councillor tyler do we need to talk about the reasons before we before we go to a vote we need to f um, have um strong enough reasons for it to stand up if it if the vote were to pass um so councillor levitt would you like to take it up from there yeah um paragraph uh Paragraph 151 of the NPF uh, states that new, renewable energy is inappropriate development in the green belt, and that um, there has been in, inadequate demonstration of uh, exceptional circumstances um, due to the harm it will create to the landscape. Which I think is paragraphs 147, 148, or something like that. Can't find them at the moment. Okay, if you're happy with that, that's fine. Um, if you had another reason as well, we'd consider that, but we'll settle with the Unacceptable harm to the green belt. Yeah, okay. It's unacceptable harm yeah. to the green belt. I can just ask are we okay with that legally? Just because if this doesn't go through, I know how we are going to end up being taken to court over this and it will cost the taxpayer a huge amount of money. So, um, Councillor Levitt has given a reason, he is in the MPPF, so as long as we're able to justify going forward, when it, if this um, application gets appealed by the applicant, then that's fine. So just for clarity, we are voting on Councillor um, Levitt's proposal to um, go against officer's recommendation to refuse the application. So a, a yes vote would be to... A, a yes vote would be to, to refuse, yes. 
I do. Yeah, I, yeah. I think it's worth saying sometimes. So in, in this instance, a yes vote would be to refuse. Okay, James. Chair, this motion is lost. That is lost. Now we come to... So that motion has been lost and there are no other proposals at the moment, so we can carry on with the debate. Or if um, someone wants to propose something alternative, the proposal will be whatever is proposed by another member. So I have now got Councillor Allen. Chair, I'd like to um, propose that we accept the recommendations of our planning officers and approve this. Thank you. And Councillor Willoughby? I would like to second uh, that we accept to grant. Thank you. And that's what you two were going to do as well, was it? Okay. So is there any further contribution to the debate on this? Okay, so we're now going to vote on Councillor Allen's proposal to accept the recommendation, in which case a yes vote means yes. <laughs> James, here we go. Chair, this motion is carried. Thank you. At um, which point I suggest we take a break for 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Welcome back. We come to agenda item number seven. This is application 22 slash 00982 slash FP, Greenfelt Kennels, Luton Road, Kimpton, Hertfordshire. And uh, our officer is Andrew Hunter, who is going to present remotely. Are you there, Andrew? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, so I can I have a few updates on the application to start with. Um, firstly, an extension of time has been agreed to the 22nd of November. Uh, secondly, paragraph 4.3.26 of the report should have the, the number 34.39% um, amended to 38.95% to reflect the figure in the energy strategy statement on its last page. And the other update is that following the adoption of the uh, new uh, local plan last week there, um, uh, um, this has meant that the references to the 1996 previously adopted local plan in the Officer reports, which was which was completed um, before the new local plan was adopted, um, that means those references to those previous local plan policies um, have now been removed, and these changes are set out in an addendum um, to the officer committee reports for this item, and. The addendum is on the website and it has been circulated to the members. Um, so if we can go on to the slides now, please. So if we go to the first slide. So this shows the, the site. It's a previous dog kennels business behind an associated dwelling, which is at, at the front. Um, the business has now um, closed and the land has been cleared of most buildings, structures and vegetation. Um, the oak tree car repair garage to the east is the only neighbor and the rest of the site is enclosed by agricultural fields. There is a line of mature trees on the west boundary. The nearest dwelling is approximately 300 metres away to the west. And the locality has a rural agricultural character and is in the green belt. The proposal is for the redevelopment and change of use of the sites to be residential, involving the clearance of building structures and vegetation, and the erection of three detached four bedroom bungalows, each with pitched roofs. Parking for the dwellings and visitors is included. There would be new hods and soft landscaping and the existing access would be uh, used and also widened. So I think if we go on to the next slide. Um, um, so here are some photos of the, the site and the surroundings. So this photo is looking south down the site um, from, the, from the entrance and there is an existing dwelling on the left. And the second photo um, shows more of that dwelling. And the next photo, um, this shows some of the open countryside on the western side. Um, photo number four is looking into the site from inside the, the entrance and some mature trees can be seen on the left and the right. And the next photo 
is looking south into the sites from the, the west boundary. Um, the next photo, um, this is looking towards the site from, uh, from the west. And photo number seven, um, this again is um, looking at the site to the west, but also um, looking south down the west boundary. And you can see a, a line of mature trees there. And the, the photo after that, this shows the middle area of the site behind the dwelling at the front. And photo number nine, um, this is the, the site lo looking to the rear. And the next photo um, shows the rear part of the site. And photo 11, this shows trees and vegetation a short distance south of, of the rear boundary. And I can now go on to the plans. So the site location plan, the next plan, the existing and proposed site plans, but I should mention that the the, the existing site plan is, um, that was obviously before um, it had been cleared of the of the buildings and structures. Um, and I, I believe that they, they had remained up until May or June of, of this year, and it's only been fairly, only in the, some point in the summer that um, the, um, those works took place to clear the site. Um, so after this, we've got on the next plan, the floor and roof plans of the plots one and two dwellings. And the next plan shows the elevations for plot one. And then the plot two elevations are on the plan after that. And the next plan shows the floor and roof plans of plot three. And the plot three elevations are on the next plan. And the final plan is a, a street scene plan. And the recommendation is to grant. And that's the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, um, Andrew. Does, uh, do members have any questions for the officer? None forthcoming. Okay, well, in that case, we'll move to our registered speaker. Um, we've got uh, an, an objector, uh, Mr. Burns, or Councillor Burns, I should say, from the Parish Council. Um, so if you'd like to uh, begin your presentation, the clock will start and you've got five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'm Neil Burns, and I'm representing Kimpton Parish Council, who have registered objection to this application. Uh, for ease of reference, I will use the clause numbers uh, referred to in the planning officer's report, and I'll try and keep this fairly specific. Uh, just of all, to add to item one, site history, uh, the overall Grenfield site uh, is actually Castellation number 55955200 by HM Land Registry Castellation number. Uh, I think that's relevant because in the last three years, there have been three planning applications granted by the council. First in 2000 was the conversion of a single stable block to provide a four bedroomed dwelling house. The second in 2021 was the erection of three dwellings, two three bedroomed and one four bedroomed property, uh, which was approved. And that is the application which this current application seeks to replace. And thirdly, only last week, in fact, exactly a week ago today, the council granted uh, permission for the extension of the existing dwelling at the front of the site by 100 metres squared to be subdivided into two four bedroom dwellings. In terms of the uh, planning officer's report item 4.3.4, which is inappropriate development, uh, the application does not meet either of the two tests of NPPF 149G. Firstly, the proposal is not contributing to an identified affordable housing need. And secondly, the proposal has an impact 
upon the openness of the green belt. In A, the proposed dwellings are now 4.7 metres in height, over twice the height of the existing buildings, and significantly higher than that contained within the 2021 approved scheme. This significantly increases the intrusion into the green belt. B, the current application seeks to relocate the dwellings 20 metres further to the south, away from the existing house on the public road. This places a far greater visual intrusion into the green belt. And C, the existing mature trees to the southeast are removed in this scheme, reducing screening and increasing the visual intrusion into the green belt. In item 4.3.6, of the officer's report, previously developed land, uh, H, uh, NHC defined land excluded from PDL as, and I quote, land that has previously developed, but where the remains of the permanent structure or fixed surface structures have blended into the landscape. If you refer to uh, the aerial photographs contained within the planning submissions, you will note that um, this photograph is taken before the land was stripped, that the existing buildings were substantially dilapidated and overgrown with vegetation. The appearance of the site is mainly of grassland and wooded areas. The site should therefore not be considered as previously developed land within NHDC's definition. Item 4.3.9, very special circumstances. NHC state that the proposal is inappropriate development land unless very special circumstances exist. NHC state that the existence of a prior approved planning application is however considered a VSC. We dispute this statement. The current application must be considered upon its content against the planning regulations and not granted simply because there was a previous approved application. This application is substantially different from that given permission in 2021. One minute, Mr. Burns. Um, the development size and volume. Uh, the applicant has made an application on the basis that the existing uh, development was 1,400 meters squared. Uh, this figure is incorrect. The actual size of the development is only 50% of that and the proposed development is actually larger than the existing. In the evaluations, open pen areas were included within the calculation. Uh, the area of the new scheme is agreed with NHDC that it is 30 square meters larger than the previous application. And this in its own right should be a reason for not granting an application for a greater extension of building area in the green belt. And finally, I'd just like to say, in addition to the technical grounds against planning application, uh, in terms of reducing of community benefit, the current proposal offers only four bedroom properties. If this application is approved, it will result in the site comprising entirely of six four bedroom houses. None of the housing needs identified Thank in you, the Kimpton Paris Burns. Housing Survey would be met. Thank you. you and it would be a reduction in community benefits. Uh, Thank you. Conclusion. Thank you very much. Um, do members have any points of clarification for the speaker? Nothing coming up. Thank you very much in that case. Uh, we've got um, Nikki Tribble now in support of the application. Good evening, Chairman, members of the Planning Committee, um, and everyone here to see us this evening. Um, I am Nikki Tribble of Figment Architecture, and I am representing the applicant for this case. Um, and I would like to thank you for the opportunity to speak on their behalf. Uh, this is a proposal for new housing stock, which relates to an existing permission on the site for three dwellings. The site has substantial history, but the main focus of the approval is for three detached single story dwellings, which were approved in 2021. In response to the council's concerns of inappropriate development in Greenbelt, we comment that the principle of the residential redevelopment of the site has already been agreed and supported by officers under the current permission. This development could be implemented under the current permission. The applicant, however, purchased the site with the intention of making some minor changes to the layout, the form and the character of the development. This revised 
proposal seeks to change the location of the access road, which will now run along the west side of the site. This design change encourages the retention and protection of the mature trees along the west boundary of the site. The new dwellings will occupy a similar position and orientation to the current permissions. In terms of the massing, this revised scheme proposes 599 square metres of gross external area. The existing buildings on the site amount to approximately 1,400 square metres, although I would like to just point out that, uh, as the gentleman said, he wouldn't count the dilapidated uh, buildings on the site. However, he said there was half, approximately half, which would make 700 square metres, meaning that we are still under that with the 599. Uh, the reduction in the build form can only enhance the character and appearance of the locality and results in a substantial improvement to the openness of the Greenbelt. The current permission provides a scheme in which minimal and modern, which is minimal and modern in terms of character and appearance. The scheme proposes traditional pitch roof and external materials which are more in keeping with the rural build styles found locally. The low rise hit roofs will not extend above the maximum height which has already been agreed and I would like to emphasize that the ridge height has not been increased from the original. Um, it hasn't. <laughs> um, it's not above what was uh, originally agreed. Um, the house types vary slightly in detail and add interest to the development, which includes alternative built materials, brick detailing, and design detailing including multi-stock rustic brick plinths, oak frame features, and horizontal board cladding. Careful attention has been paid to the street elevation to create interest and add variety to the build form. It is the application's intention to develop in a more in-keeping style and form to enhance the Greenbelt setting. We would like to reiterate that the officers support in this application and conclude the benefits of the scheme as follows. Providing three new, develop, uh, new dwellings and associated benefits, improvements to the openness of the Greenbelt, a substantial reduction in vehicle movements. To summarise, all material and planning considerations have been considered and dealt with appropriately. The proposed development meets current policies requirements as outlined in the case officer's report and design approach is a traditional low rise form of development that will be carefully integrated into the existing landscape setting with no greater impact than the current permission. The principle of the development has already been agreed by way of the existing permission. Respectfully, for these reasons, we trust that you will be able to support the proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do members have any um, questions for clarification? Yes, Councillor Mason. I'm surprised no one beat me to it. Can somebody give a factual answer to the height? I'm slightly disturbed that we're getting two con contradictory um, arguments on the height, whether whether it exceeds the heights of the previous development, previous proposals. Um, yeah, I think perhaps we could just um, seek clarification from the officer when um, we've finished asking. Um, no, I'm I'm sorry, sir. You've had your you've had your chance. Do um do members have any other points of clarification for the? speaker okay well we'll come back to um our officer mr hunter now on this and see um if he can pick up any of the points that have been made including the ridge height issue andrew um okay so oh the i think uh, overall um visually um without having taken any, any measurements the highest point of the dwellings um approved by the 2021 permission uh, does, does seem similar to that of the um the, the the ridge heights of the of the dwellings now proposed um although the the roofs are um overall uh a lot larger um for um of, 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 of for this um the, this new application in terms of um bulk and volume um so if that's my answer to um uh, to that um and to try and address some of the other points by um by by the objector um the the two other applications were um 
outside of this particular um, uh, part of the site to be developed and were able um, to be determined on their own merits against the against relevant green up belt policies that that um, and other considerations that apply to them and um, as with the 2021 uh, uh, permission um, all, all of the proposals were considered to um, comply with um, a green belt and other, and other relevant, relevant policies and and, and um, the and this current proposal is considered um, to do so uh, uh, as well um, the there there are only three dwellings proposed here um, and th th that means this falls without with under the um, the, the national minimum thresholds of um, of where affordable housing um, can be can, can be put can be sought, um, which is eleven dwellings. Um, so um, that there can't be any um, affordable housing sort, sorts as part of this development. Um, in terms of the impact on openness, as um, as stated uh, 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 earlier by Nikki Triple, um, the, the the impacts are essentially quite comparable to the twenty twenty one permission um, because there is th these dwellings are only um, thirty uh, square meters uh, larger in terms of their of their footprint um, and and their volume um, and I would also add that um, they are now proposed to be moved away from the or further away from the the west boundary of the site than the that than the 2021 permission so you could say that 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 reduces their their visibility um from from outside the site um and I, I would say that, that, that overall, that um, the, the, site, the, the site as it previously existed before it was cleared, could, the buildings um, and structures could could largely um, be be overall be considered as being previously developed lands. So even if there might have been even if one or two of the the buildings um, might have been a bit dilapidated. Um, Overall, there is um, a again in terms of the the openness to the green belt, and and certainly as the twenty twenty one permission um, was granted for it relatively recently and is still extant, then that is a a material consideration which um, does need to be taken into account in in terms of assessing. This application. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, well, I haven't got anyone asking to comment or ask Andrew any further um, points of clarification. So we can move to the debate on this one. And uh, Councillor Alan Daniel would like to start. Um, I'd like to really thank. Um, both the members of the public for coming and speaking this evening. Um, however, I do want to make a quick complaint that yet again, we've had an item called in that should have been approved by officers, by a councillor who hasn't bothered to turn up. Now, I understand that they may be away at university, but they could have got somebody else to speak for them. And in their reason for calling this in, it's literally personal opinion. They have given no reason to call this in. Chair, I don't think this should have been before us. I think you should have probably spoken against this. And I would suggest that due to that reason, we follow our officers' recommendations and approve this. That is a proposal. Thank you, um, Daniel, for that. I would just say that um, the um, councillor who called this in did so in support of the um, parish council's objection. And yes, he should be here to speak on it. Um, but his... there's nothing to say that though chair 
and he hasn't contacted anyone by email saying, if you read what it says in there, there's nothing to say that he's called this in because of the council, as opposed to other things where they do say why they've uh, called it in. Yeah, well, that was, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is not, this is not a public event at which you can speak, I'm afraid. No, can you not, please? Um, thank you, Mr. Burns, but really, we will, we can talk privately at the end if you've got an issue with the constitution and how it's applied. But um, really, I think we, we know what's, what's what, and, um, I think we, we would just we'll take your point, Councillor Allen, and we'll move on from there. So you have proposed that we um, accept the recommendation from the officers. Councillor Willoughby. Uh, I, I will uh, second uh, Councillor Allen's, um, and I will also go on to speak, if that's all right, um, Chair. Um, I think... Uh, <laughs> It's quite a, a difficult one. I think when you, we, uh, in the sense that I understand, I absolutely understand uh, the objections to it. I think um, uh, we've just talked about the green belt, but on the basis that there are th currently three, uh, uh, sorry, there was currently a previous uh, approval uh, for very similar. I don't think that uh, this will be too dissimilar or so dissimilar that uh, I don't think that we could um, approve it uh and currently the site is a dump to be play to be plain with that i don't think building some housing is going to make it worse i think it can only make it better thank you alistair councillor muir you chair um condition eight trees um on the west side we saw a photograph of uh well-established trees and there were gaps between those trees. Um, so I would like to see those gaps filled with further trees. And on the east side, um, I don't think there was any trees. So I like to see some plant in there. So could that be taken in hand? Thank you for that, Michael. Can I ask our officers if that's a possibility uh thank you chair i'll take this one um yes i'm just having sorry i'm just familiarizing myself with condition eight um it does require the um prior to the commencement of approved development the following landscape detail shall be submitted so they do need to submit a landscaping scheme it does require that that landscape scheme outlines what's to be retained existing on site and what's to be added um so the, there is opportunity for for the applicants to propose increased landscaping to to the boundaries um we can go one step further if you wish because at the moment there is a b c d requirements we could for example add e and specifically require increased planting to the west and eastern boundaries as an amendment to that condition uh do that thank you Thank you very much. So we've got an additional condition to amendment to condition eight. An amendment to condition eight to consider as well. I've got Councillor Hunter waiting. Thank you, Chairman. Um, quite interesting that we have two in the green belt tonight. Uh, the simple reason uh, I couldn't support the last one, but this one, I know that if we were of a mind not to go with the officer's opinion we would lose in front of an inspector because it's a question of whether you consider it as previously developed land and on top of that the previous applications where uh, our planning people have actually granted so in all honesty chairman uh, i will go with the officer's recommendation thank you very much councillor levitt um, I was going to say pretty much what Councillor Hunt has said, although I would refer back to the last one where we did grant permission. Uh, and one of the when it, when it came to balance and conclusion, it was considered inappropriate at, at, at one point. But the um, the balance and conclusion came to the local planning authorities not able to demonstrate a five year housing land supply. The tilted balance uh, of paragraph 11 is therefore engaged, which requires permission unless there's their impacts and doing so would significantly demonstrate outweighed benefits. So the was, uh, 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 it is different in the light that last time, it, one of the, uh, the main reason for granting was that we did not have a five year land supply. This time we do. However, 
um, I, I agree with what Councillor Hunter says, because we've already granted permission, because it's already been uh, designated as previously de developed land, and I'll refer, I'll just, I won't refer back to the last one about what can happen. Um, I don't see that we have any choice but to grant it. Yep. I mean, conditional consent is is in place already, and I think legally that probably means that that exists as such, and now that is the very special circumstance that means that um, we can continue. Okay, so we've got a proposer and... Oh, we've got uh, Councillor Allen again. Um, still happy to propose with that amendment. Sorry, okay. And Councillor Willoughby, were you content with that? Yeah, so we're going to uh, propose to um, accept the, the officer's recommendation with that amendment to condition eight about additional planting. Okay, James. Thank you very much. Jen's motion is carried. Thank you, Abby. Okay, uh, we move on to item eight. 2201920 stroke um, FPH 14 Oakfields Avenue in Nebworth Hearts. And we've got... 103. <laughs> And uh, Thomas Howe is going to present. Thank you, Chair, and good evening, members. Uh, I've got two updates for you all today. Um, in light of the local plan being adopted, where my re report uh, references uh, saved policies and uh, the emerging nature of the local plan, um, just omit the saved policies and uh, refer to the uh, now saved policies. Um, my recommendation still stands. And also, uh, there is an amendment to condition four of uh, item eight uh, related to the planting of a tree. I do understand that there is some hoarding erected and some commencement of works related to extant permissions has uh, occurred. So rather than the um, condition relating to commencement of works, it now should read or will it be updated to read? Uh, one replacement native semi-mature tree with a recommended girth of between 16 and 18 centimetres must be planted in the front garden area of the property 14 Oakwoods Avenue within one year of the date of this decision. And should the, the tree die within five years of it being planted, the tree must be replaced in the following plant season, planting season. Um, because two applications are being considered at the same address, I will introduce the site just once and then uh, introduce the applications in isolation and allow them to be debated in isolation. Please can have the presentation. Next slide, please. This is the uh, JS map showing number 14. Uh, it is a detached bungalow to the north of Oakfields Avenue and is in a residential area of Nebworth. It's not listed. It's not in the conservation area. Uh, and uh, next slide, please. And again, please. Just This is a proposed block plan. And uh, into my photos, please. So this is a photo from my first site visit. Uh, the copper beech tree you see there in the center of the picture has now been felled. And also there are some, as I say, hoarding erected and the commencement of works uh, to, the, to the, that left-hand side of the building. Uh, next slide, please. This is the primary area where the uh, works related to item eight will occur. Uh, and as you see, there is number 14. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the location where item nine will be erected. Um, and yeah, next slide, please. And this is just a rear elevation of the dwelling as seen from the garden. Next slide, please. So um, I was asked to detail what 
the plans indicate, um, of course, due to the extant nature of some of the works. So the um, front elevation, which is above, so the upper one, is extant, and the one below is what is proposed. Um, effectively, this application is looking to join up extant permissions with the emission of uh, certain roof elements. Now a uh, pitch has been erected to obscure and soften that uh, flat roof of the lift crown. Next slide, please. This is the side elevation, of course, with the uh, approved plan above and the now proposed one below. Uh, this is seen from the, I believe, eastern side. So this is not where, uh, this is not along where item eight will occur, but you can see that rear extension on the right hand side and the proposed or the, the garage to the left of the main dwelling. Next slide, please. This is the opposite side elevation with the garage uh, on the right. So the principal elevation is to the right and uh, that side extension with the roof joined up to the rear extension, which is obscured by the existing garage. Uh, next slide, please. And this is uh, the, the left hand side is the uh, floor plan, which was previously approved by a split decision. And of course, extant and on the right is what is proposed. So you can see that the um, garage to the rear is now retained uh, and is quoted as office uh, and the rear extension with the um, bifold doors uh, is part of uh, rear extension and it is basically where to the left of those doors is uh, joining up to that garage uh, from what is a, a neighborhood consultation scheme extension. And then there is that down the side to the left extension as well. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, will actually go back, uh, please. Uh, one matter is um, the loss of the copper beach to the front garden was strongly objected to by neighbours. And this tree was also considered to contribute to the locality given its large size and pleasing crown. Uh, it was felled without being a breach of planning, given that it was not protected by a tree protection order and the site is not in a conservation area. Um, and therefore it's not, as I say, not a breach of planning, but also not a reason necessarily to refuse. However, a condition is attached to both applications requiring that a tree be planted to the front garden to replace this felled tree and contribute to the street scene along Oakfield Avenue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do members have any questions for the officer? I've got Councillor Willoughby. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I just wanted to check because I've just been I'm just reading through the report again, and um, the parish council is objecting uh, because they're saying it's a poor design and out of character. The design and in then in, in design and appearance of four point uh, three point four. Uh, you're saying it's of sufficient, uh, sorry, uh, sufficiently sympathetic and suitable. Um, is that in line with the neighborhood plan, or is that, uh, or is that, uh, an officer opinion that it's sufficiently sympathetic? I'll give you a chance to, <laughs> to, to read the part 4.3.4. So um, the neighbourhood plan, specifically policy KBBE4 design, does reference uh, the design of the buildings and it references um, possible. Well, uh, so it, it says building forms and proportions, roofscapes and overall appearances can be considerate towards and positively contribute to the local character of the village. Uh, and responding to local character should not res result in pastiche replicas. Instead, emphasis can be placed on contemporary interpretations of traditional built forms to achieve the objectives of the neighborhood plan. Um, but I would say that it is in tr traditional nature. It is as expected um, for a dwelling of this size. And uh, yes, it, it is in keeping, in my opinion, and also I would say it complies with the, the provisions of the neighborhood plan. Uh, are there any other questions for the officer? 
Okay, in that case, we come to our registered speakers and we'll begin with um, Mr. Peter Calver. And you've got five minutes from when you start. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Peter Calver. I live next door to the application site. I'm also speaking on behalf of Mr. Steve Crone, who lives opposite, and Mr. Bill Martin of number five. The two applications should be considered together as they are effectively a single development for this property. Surrounding a 1926 bungalow on all sides with flat roofed extensions is entirely out of character and sympathy with the existing building and its surrounding properties. Oakfields Avenue should be considered as a character neighborhood whose origins are from the Lutchins inspired Nebworth Garden Village project from the early 20th century. An image of this property can be seen in the original prospectus for Nebworth Garden Village project. The bungalow should then perhaps be described as a building of special architectural interest and therefore it should be treated with respect. The proposed plans would attach a large double garage across the front, which undoubtedly be detrimental to the street scene. Very little of the original structure will be visible. This is contrary to the published contrary uh, North Hearts Council and Parish Council local plan policies. These policies state that the layout, design, existing features and character of the surroundings must be considered. Quoting the council's own policy document, Concern for the site and surroundings is equally, if not more important, for conversions. Single dwellings can have a disastrous impact on the street scene or the building itself. Existing features should be retained as far as possible, and developments on sites in areas having established character will need careful consideration as to whether they are acceptable at all. What is the point of the council developing these policies and publishing them if they're not followed? Many surrounding properties have been developed over the years in sympathy of their origins, and they should continue. It should be noted that the statutory notices for these applications were not originally displayed at the site by the applicant. It was only after my objections to these applications were received by council planning that they were then displayed with scant few days remaining for objections. Planning extended the time for objections, but the notices were not updated at the site, so the local community reading these would think they were out of time to object. Another extension was put forward, and it was interesting to note that the planning officer visited the site to fix the notices to ensure they were displayed for the full period. These applications cannot be considered without reference to the felling of a significant 80 year old beech tree on the boundary between numbers 12 and 14. My concerns were raised as the original previous application plans did not show this tree. I informed the council planning and the plans were amended to include the tree. I met the planning officer, Thomas Howe, and the council tree officer, Carl Wilkins, on site on my property for them to inspect the tree with a view to imposing a TPO on this significant specimen tree. The tree officer said, and I quote, the following of this tree will be criminal. He rated the tree definitely meriting a tree preservation order and considered the tree to be in joint ownership between myself and number 14. The applicant in the signed declaration stated that no trees were to be felled, and this was reaffirmed by emails between the applicant's agents and council planning. The application for the detached garage under the tree was refused because of this tree. Early Sunday morning, the 12th of June, with no consultation or warning while I was away on holiday, the magnificent beech tree was felled. The time, date and circumstances chosen clearly to circumvent any intervention by myself or the council. Mr. Martin attempted to intervene by printing out the declaration stating that no trees to be felled and confronted the contractors with it. He even called the police who weren't interested. My daughter happened to visit whilst the felling was in progress and threatened that she should not park her car or linger in my drive because they might drop the tree on it. The contractors carried on, leaving a four metre high stump. Despite my repeated concerns and the tree officer recommendation, the TPO was not imposed and the significant amenity tree is gone. It should be noted that statutory notices uh, were, were not uh, Just one minute posted left. for, these, uh, for these, uh, the, these applications. And the, uh, I'm losing my way here a bit, sorry. Uh, the rear extension was, was was posted, but not the front extensions. And the felling of the tree meant many local people have taken interest and have said they were unaware of these previous applications, probably due to the lack of the statutory notices. Objections to these current applications are equally valid for those previously passed by delegated power, and consideration should be given to the withdrawal of previous planning uh, because of not complying with or com following the planning process. Considerable weight should be given to the local objections from the neighbourhood and the Nebworth Parish Council. 
and these should, these applications should be refused. Thank you very much. Um, do members have any points of clarification that they'd like to um, put to Mr. Carver? Councillor Levitt. Uh, just just a quickie. Um, you said you were a neighbour. Are you are you actually number sixteen, which is twelve, which is the bigger bigger house? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I've got no one else asking to speak, so we'll turn now to um, the member advocate who's um, speaking against the application, and that's Councillor Lisa Nash. Thank you. Ten separate householders and Nebworth Parish Council wish to strongly object to this planning application for a single storey rear and side extensions and erection of attached double garage to the front of the existing dwelling. There has been a piecemeal approach to planning applications relating to this property, of which I believe there have been a considerable number of applications, which has caused confusion to residents who feel that they cannot comment fully. They would have preferred to have had a single application to appreciate the impact of this development. This property is currently unoccupied and stands proudly on the road in full view of neighbouring properties and the street scene. Oakfields Avenue was built in keeping with the garden village design which provides wide main avenues and large gardens similar to those that you see in Letchworth and is protected. This application disregards this approach as an incomplete contract, conflict with the adopted neighbourhood plan. Oakfields Avenue is recognised as a character road in Nebworth's adopted neighbourhood plan. To allow this application to go ahead would make a nonsense of any adopted neighbourhood plan, which are underpinned by higher level planning policies, including the MPPF. One objective of Nebworth's neighbourhood plan is to retain the existing architectural character of the garden village, which this proposal is contrary to KNP KBBE4. This proposal is not in keeping with the character of the property, nor those surrounding it which have pitched roofs. As well as not being in keeping with surrounding properties, the, the roof suggests for this application is also not in keeping with its own architectural characteristics. The large garage dominates the front of the property and is disproportionate to the size of the property itself and significantly forward of the building line. These features significantly neg negatively impact on the street scene for the neighbouring residents of whom 10 householders have objected different households. This application is also contrary to NHDC policies 28 around house extensions and 57 residential guidelines and standards by not retaining the shape and existing features of the property and is also contrary to the now adopted local plan policy D2 due to the adverse effect on the character and appearance of the street scene. The road has unique characteristics which should be protected. Several neighbours were horrified at the felling of the beech tree, which was due to have a TPO put on it, as you've heard. It would be preferable that a new and complete planning application is submitted, which accurately shows changes in the property to date and all proposed alterations in one singular planning application, which is in character to the street scene and sympathetic to the garden village approach and is compliant with planning policy, including the insertion of pitched rather than flat roofs. If you are, however, minded to approve this application, I request that two conditions are attached to it. As already stated by the planning officer, the reinstatement of the tr of a tree to replace that which was fell felled to maintain the environment. And that due to the disproportionate size of the garage, which is significantly forward of the building line, that permitted rights are removed and conversion to residential use should not be allowed. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Do members have any points of clarification for Councillor Nash? Councillor Levitt. Evening, Lisa. Um, am I right in thinking that this is the only house in this in the street that hasn't been altered or extended in any way? Look, I, I haven't been able to visit it, but I'm just looking on Go, uh, street, Google Street scene, and it looks like it's the only one that is 
as a, as originally it looks like everything else around it has been changed or extended they have been um but in keeping with the character and any other alterations have happened prior to the neighborhood plan being adopted which specifically mentions oakfields avenue thank you anyone else Um, Lisa, I just maybe a, a quick one myself. I think you mentioned that it, at some point I didn't quite catch the exact sentence, but you said it was uh, protected um, in some way. Could you just clarify what you meant by that? Um, do you mean that the property, the road is actually it's um, in the neighbourhood plan and it, that road is actually listed. I'm just trying to find my actual where I've written it. Um yeah, it's a recognised character road in Nebworth's adopted neighbourhood plan um, in order that, that the characteristics of the garden village design are maintained with those nice broad open roads and th all those kind of characteristics which you'd see commonly in Letchworth. Thank you, that's great. Okay, um, if there are no other... Um, members wishing to ask a question or a point of clarification from Lisa, then we'll move to um, our next public speaker on this, who is in support of the application, and that is Mr. Justin Reed. Over to you. Thank you, Chair, and good evening, members. My name is Justin Reed, and I'm, I'll be representing the applicant for this application and the other application at 14 Oak, Oakfield Avenue. I would like to point out the applicant was previously granted prior approval for a single story rare extension with a depth of three, sorry, with a depth of 5.32 meters and granted planning permission for a single story side um, front extension and conversion of a garage into a room. Um, this application essentially seeks to connect the two applications together. So um, as you'll be aware that you can't connect um, permitted development and a planning application. So this application just seeks to um, connect the two together. We know um, there have been points regards to the established character in the street, but um, looking down the street, you would see that there's a range of um, types of houses. Some are single story, some are two story. And I would argue that there isn't a established character along the street. Um, essentially, I would um, argue that the difference between the two approved applications and the one which is which is currently being considered is um, very slight in differences. With regards to the tree, um, we note that the a, a tree was felled in June, the 12th of June, um, and the the planning officer has recommended to put a condition on the on the application, which requires the client, which requires my client to plant another tree. Um, as the planning officer stated, there was no breach, um, as the tree did not have a pre tree preservation order on it, um, and there was essentially no breach. So I would argue that um, as the tree does not form part of this application, um, it sh there shouldn't be a condition attached um, in relation to it. That's all, thanks. Thank you very much. Do members have any points of clarification? No. Uh, in that case, uh, can we ask uh, Thomas how if he's got any responses to those points that have been raised? Thank you uh, to our speakers. Um, right. So I uh, also one matter is I do consider the design and impact of both 1920 and 1921. Um, and I would say I would support both being erected. Um, I would consider the design as being sympathetic. And I do note that the neighbored plan does discuss Oakfields Avenue and views down Oakfields Avenue, especially. 
Um, and that's why a previous application was refused for a, a detached garage to the front, or at least it was split decision and that was refused. Uh, and that this is set back and I would consider that the frontage is still open um, and that you can still see a majority of the kind of the design of this dwelling regardless of the direction of the extensions you still see that is definitely that same chalet bungalow and uh, there is a lot of variation along Oakfields Avenue of both chalet bungalows and two-story dwellings also opposite is a detached garage and I think three or four doors down there is also a detached front garage. Um, with regards to the site notices, uh, I do. Uh, I was uh, informed that, well, Mr. Carver did say that site notices were not put up. So uh, to be absolutely sure, I went and put two site notices up with a new expiry date, uh, a full expiry date to allow for a full consultation, just to be absolutely sure, especially with the in, uh, local interest in the applications. Um, Uh, with regards to the matters of submitting two applications, the applicant is well within their rights to submit uh, the applications as, and uh, also um, they are detached from each other because, of course, there is the, the single-storey rear side and front extensions and that single-storey front and side, so they're both detached so they don't interact and, um, yeah, there's no crossover. And... Also, uh, and uh, we did not remove the PD rights previously uh, with regards to that front garage, and I don't believe we can. Sorry, I'll, I'll just quickly come in on this point. Um, it's the point that Councillor Nash made in terms of requesting those conditions. I think it was two conditions were suggested one requiring planting of the tree which is already included i think the other condition was removing pd rights so that the applicants couldn't convert the proposed double garage to the front um this wasn't imposed on the extent permission um so it could be considered unreasonable to now impose a condition when we didn't do before without any other change in material circumstances and usually when we would impose such a condition, it's to retain it for parking, if there's a lack of parking. Um, looking at the site, um, I think the site has ample parking to the front. So, for example, if one day they were to um, convert that garage uh, and it wasn't available for parking anymore, the site would still benefit from sufficient parking in accordance with the parking standards. So um, it's our view that there wouldn't be reasonable justification to impose such a condition. Thomas, were you done? Yes. Um, I would also, um, well, I, I object to the omission of the tree condition because I would argue that uh, there is some materiality to it given that the previous application was split decision based on the impacts to the root protection zone of a tree. And uh, I would consider that the well, the planting of a tree to the front garden would be a positive impact to both this number 14 and the wider Oakfields Avenue area, especially with the neighbourhood plan, um, citing the views towards Bradbury End as a positive one. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we move to the debate now. And um, Councillor Willoughby has indicated that he'd like to kick things off. Thank you, Chair. Um, having uh, heard uh, everything that has to be said and it and and read through this, I think this is, uh, it's it's interesting because there was an argument that there was a character, but I think um, we've heard from uh, several uh, people now that actually the character doesn't seem to necessarily um, stop some of these changes and certainly uh, the neighbourhood plan, which was uh, uh, brought into the conversation. Um, uh, by Councillor Nash uh, uh, actually doesn't necessarily stop um, things being changed. And as um, uh, the planning officer, uh, Thomas said, you are allowed to emphasize some of these differences. 
I <laughs> cannot understand. I, I, I don't think that the idea of removing the trees at, at all a good idea. I think actually when we talk about the environmental factor of that um, is one thing, but actually uh, if there is a if there is an objection based on visual as well from some of the neighbours, then the tree can only help uh, uh, mitigate some of that as well. Um, I would actually like to move to, uh, uh, to propose to um, Grant, or at least not take it, not not grant it anymore, as it as it is. So, I, with the amended condition of the tree. Just being reminded of the amended condition that Thomas Howe mentioned at the beginning of his presentation. Um, and uh, Tom Ellington is going to talk us through that. So it's just a sort of reiteration and reminder and hopefully clarify. As Thomas, right at the beginning is in his presentation, he, he mentioned is one of the updates that he's updated condition for. Um, because the condition in your report refers to it shall be planted um, in relation to commencement, we are now aware that commencement has taken place. So it's not necessarily reasonable to pin it on the commencement. So now it's been reworded that a tree shall be planted within one year should permission be granted. It's just, it's effectively still requiring the same thing. It's just, should we say the trigger or the hook is proposed to be changed. So if you're moving for accepting the officer's recommendation, it's also with the recommended change to that condition. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to come back to Councillor Willoughby, who uh, made that proposal. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I will move to, uh, I will propose to um, grant with that um, amendment. And do we have a seconder for that? Councillor Allen. Happy to second. Can we make sure that the um, wording ensures that it's in the front garden as opposed to just on the property? Um, I know that there's also um, the consideration about um, Councillor Nash's suggestion of not allowing residential in the garage, and um, we were said no due to parking. With a tree of that size, because we're insisting on a tree of 14 to 16 um, centimetre girth, um, does that mean that there will still be ample parking at the front of the property for two vehicles? Do you want to take that? Thank you, Jake. Could we um, bring up the slides, please? Um, I think the site plan. <laughs> Sorry, this post site plan that has uh, various shades of grey showing existing dwelling. Next one, please. That one. There you go. Um, so you can see sort of there's, there's quite a generous frontage to the property. Um, the tree which was removed was to the south east boundary, right on the edge of it. So if they were to plant, for example, in a similar area, sorry, this, this plan doesn't show you where the driveway is, but having had a look at Google Street View, the, the ample driveway is to the opposite side. So I think both could be accommodated, is the answer. Thomas. So, Thomas, yes. And also the um, condition does say uh, must be planted in the front garden area of the property. So, okay. Thank you very much. So um, Daniel, now in all of that, I've forgotten whether you were seconding or not. You are, okay, that's excellent. So we've got a, a proposer and a seconder. We've got a couple more uh, members who wish to speak on this. Um, Councillor Mason to start with. Thanks. I'm sorry, I think I rather missed the boat and I had another question I wanted to ask of the officers, which was, uh, uh, I was slightly concerned that Councillor Nash mentioned that, 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 that a tree preservation order was imminent on this tree when it was, uh, when it was cut down. I was, I was, I was going to ask whether that was, we were aware if that was true or not, because that would, would concern me. I was, I'm not sure if it's material to the, to the point in question. Um, what I would say is as an absolute minimum, um, and if if we were minded to accept this, that there should be a new tree should be planted. And could I also suggest, I noticed on the earlier application, there was 
when a, when a tree planting or trees being planted, there was also a, a specification that if something terrible happened to that tree within five years, it'd have to be replanted. So I'd hate to think this new tree could go the same way as its predecessor. Um, I thought I heard that on this application. It was. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, we've got uh, Councillor Muir. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. When someone has down a tree, especially a very mature tree, uh, for planning reasons, I think we should have a policy that two trees are planted instead of the one that's been failed. Now, it looks to me that two trees can't really be planted in the front, but one could plant a second one in the back garden. Um, so I'm just wondering whether we can change the condition that two trees are planted, one in the front and one in the back. Um, that's an interesting proposition. I don't know, Michael, what the garden's like at the back, and I don't know if we can make that judgment here and now. Can I ask the officers to take this on? Thank you, Chair. Um, in short, no policy exists to that effect, so we don't have a policy basis to require that. Um, however, what I would say is there's a bit of overlap here because we're trying to keep both applications separate. Both applications, because you're about to hear once we obviously term this application, there's the second application, both applications require a tree to be planted in the front garden. So in order to um, abide by those, if they if they were to build both both extensions, they've got to abide by both conditions, so they've got to plant two trees, if that gives you some comfort. Just measured roughly the length of the back garden, and it's... Uh, over one and a half times bigger in length than the front garden. So a tree in the back garden can be planted. And they've taken that tree down specially uh, for their planning. And I think they should plant two. If they left it there, then I'm quite happy that there doesn't have to be a tree in the back garden. Tom, have you got anything to, to add on this? Um, the only, sorry, thank you, Chair. The only thing I would add is, obviously, in my view, the fundamental harm that was caused was the loss of visual amenity to the street scene, i.e. the public space, which is obviously more visible than the back garden. So a planting of a tree in the back garden would have less of a mitigating impact, is my only reaction. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, Councillor Mew, I mean, you did say we should have a policy that says that, and I, I'm inclined to agree with you, but at present we don't have that policy. So I think it's quite hard to implement um, tree planting in places that we're not familiar with and where there's no, as Mr. Allington says, where there's no policy basis for doing so at present. But I think you've got a good point there. Um, Councillor Levitt. Yeah, I, I just want to come back on a permitted development rights. Um, on you said it was difficult because on a, it, we didn't put on a previous application. However, at that point, the garage was a separate building. It wasn't attached to house, was it? Thomas? So the previous application proposed two garages, which were one in the same position as we've got now. Uh, and one which was detached and at a right angle under the tree that was felled. So there was two and we only allowed one, which was the attached one. Councillor Bloxham. Thank you. Sorry to, uh, uh, and I am sorry to have to, to, to pick an argument with uh, a fellow councillor's um, comments. First of all, the comment that, uh, that Councillor Muir made was uh, it was felled for planning reasons. We might suspect that, but we have no proof of that at all. Uh, and secondly, I cannot believe that you have in the second um, uh, proposal coming up, or the uh, second application coming up, that that wording in point four is exactly the same as the first, that you actually meant there to be two trees. 
So it's, it's a small point, but I take issue with with what it, I know it's all done in in uh, in good intent, but I can't believe we we can actually go anywhere near that. Um, right. Well, we have um, we have a proposer and a seconder, so I think we should move to the vote on this one now. James. Chair, this motion is carried. Thank you very much. And then we move on to the uh, related application number um, item nine on the agenda, 22 slash 01921 slash FPH at the same address, 14 Oakfields Avenue in Nebworth. Thomas. Thank you. Please could, have, please could have a slide again, just showing the plans. Next slide, please. And again, please. So it's it's relatively hard to make out, but the uh, proposed extension is to that right elevation with the arrows pointing to it, and uh, it is flat roofed and it's red against the dwelling, which is why uh, it might not appear prominently. Um, but this is the principal elevation. Next slide, please. And uh, this is a side elevation, of course, along I believe number twelve's party boundary, with the single story extension to that left with the door, and um, a flat roof. Uh, leading off the main pictures of the dwelling. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from members to Thomas on that? Okay, uh, in that case, we have got registered speakers for this item as well. And um, Mr. Calver is uh, registered to speak on this. Is there anything you wanted to add Yes, I can add more. I, you've heard my objections to the previous application, and most of this is equally valid for this application as well. The attaching of a flat roofed extension partly to the front to the side visible from the street of this character property is entirely at odds with the original building and those surrounding it. Again, I could quote from the council's own and parish council's published policies that it should be sympathetic with the existing building and surroundings, particularly in respect of the character of the neighbourhood. Clearly, this application is designed to be part of the larger development, so the question has to be asked why it was not included as part of the previous application. The application draws show, uh, and the, the, the views you've shown here show internal layout and futures from the original bungalow, most of which no longer exist, as the rear extension has been demolished and the building gutted, so clearly this design will not stand on its own. <laughs> It should be noted the applicant's declaration state the work has started without consent. The application should be refused. Thank you very much. Uh, any points of clarification to Mr. Calvin? No, in that case, we'll move to um, member advocate, uh, Councillor Nash. Lisa, you've got five minutes again if you need. Thanks. Me. So this application was beset with inadequacies in the statutory notice period, with um, many residents unaware. Um, again, there was considerable objections from residents and Nebworth Parish Council. This proposal is contrary to local planning policy D2 and Nebworth Neighbourhood Plan policy KBBE4. It is out of character of the existing property and those surrounding it. It will have a massive impact on the street scene and neighbouring properties, many of those who have objected. As previously, this proposal is not in keeping with the character of the property, nor those surrounding it which have pitched roofs. As well as not being in keeping with surrounding properties, the flat roof suggested for this application is also not in keeping with its own architectural characteristics. This proposal significantly increases the footprint of this dwelling on its own, let alone in combination with the other application relating to this property. The proposal is not sympathetic to the character of this original garden village design dwelling and is therefore contrary to NHDC's policies 28 and 57. To grant this planning application would be 
detrimental to the ethos of the garden village design and also conflict with the adopted Nebworth neighbourhood plan. Um, as I stated previously, it would have it would have been better to have had one plan with you know complete plan with everything attached, sympathetic to the street scene and the garden village approach, and compliant with planning policy, including the insertion of the pitched rather than than the flat roofs. This road is characterised by trees and hedges. So I would argue that a second tree is wholly appropriate to improve the street scene. The tree is very relevant because it's part of the garden city approach to have the large frontages, which is, is now going to be much further forward than its neighbouring, the other um, properties that you've seen um, in the diagrams provided by the officer. Um, and that would make it very, very different. So again, I would ask that if you're minded to approve this application, that you would agree to the reinstatement of the tree or another tree um, from the original one that was felled to help maintain that street scene, because it has got a massive visual impact on those residents surrounding it. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Do members have any points of clarification again? Okay, um, well, it's back to you then, Thomas, if you've got anything you want to respond to. Oh, I do beg your pardon, we've got the um, speaker who, who's supporting the application. I'm sorry, you weren't on my original notes. So, uh, Mr. Reid. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, yeah, I don't really have much to add to this one, to be honest with you. I'd just like to point out, as we discussed, um, there is no established character along the street with properties um, varying in sizes and styles. Um, this proposal will essentially be a front infill extension, so it will create a uniform, a uniform appearance, um, and it's a relatively small addition, which um, would not harm the visual amenity of the site. Thank you very much. Thomas. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I reiterate my previous comments, but also would challenge that there is a massive impact um, given the setback nature of a dwelling and uh, the modest scale and visual impacts uh, arising from this extension. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we move to the debate and I've got Councillor Willoughby uh, waiting to speak. Sorry, I thought I might as well get the full set. Um, I, um, I, I, I understand uh, uh, the reiteration of the point about the character. But given that we've just approved a change in the in in the site in the visual of the building, that argument I don't believe would stand anymore, even when we didn't consider it uh, to, to stand that highly uh, previously. Um, I am going to propose this to Grant, but I'm going to ask the tree aspect of things. This is now a second tree, and it is on this one. Um, <laughs> I'm happy to keep it there, but I, I, uh, but I, so I'm going to propose to Grant, but I would be happy if the other uh, members show uh, a disinclination to have it, uh, and I will accept an amendment there at that point. Thank you very much. Do we have a seconder? Uh, Councillor Muir. Thank you. Um, in both applications, it says that tree to be replaced in the front garden but it doesn't say what type of tree and seeing it was a lovely beech tree that was felled i think it should state that the replacement tree should be a beech thank you is that something we can do tom through you chair um the i believe the, the condition requires a native species tree which we consider to be acceptable and sufficient um i don't necessarily have any objections to specifying the species of tree if we want to be more specific um if other members are minded to agree with councillor Muir. well i'm happy as long as we know exactly what the tree was if uh... Councillor Willoughby. Sorry, Chair, I just thought I'd really quickly point out 
we've already agreed that it could be any native tree. So this would be a second tree that would then have to be a beech. Um, and also, uh, actually, I, I, I will say that we um, someone would need to propose an amendment that it's not in the front garden necessarily, because I don't think you'd be able to fit two trees of that size in that area. Thank you for that, Alistair. Um, we'll just bear that in mind for the moment. And um, I want to hear from Councillor Bloxham. It'll probably come as no surprise. I'm, I'm want to talk about the tree. I can't um, see why we've got an extra tree. Why why do two trees make that much of a difference from the one huge tree that was there in the first place? I I, I just think we're being a bit uh, punitive. Is probably the uh, the wrong word, but I I, I think we, we've we've got our tree in the front, which replaces that one that wasn't cut down uh, or potentially was not cut down for uh, uh, planning reasons, and we we should leave it at that. Thank you. Over to you, Tom. Thank you, Chair. And I, I take your point, Councillor Boxham. Um, however, um, clearly a replacement tree is important, as it's been debated so much. Um, these are two separate applications, two separate extensions. We don't know if the applicant will impose both of them. So, for example, they may not build the one we've just voted on. Oh, sorry, you've just voted on. Um, in which case, that condition doesn't bite. They may just build this single story extension, in which case we need the same condition. Then a better wording would be, yeah. It's not, yeah, okay. Um, fine, I think we should just um, stick with that technical reason that these are two separate applications and they've both got their conditions attached to them. On the subject of what kind of tree it is, I think that I would be much more inclined to stick with the wording that's here, which is reasonably precise in terms of it being a native semi-mature tree um, of, of a certain size. And I think uh, we don't want to overcomplicate things any more than necessary at this stage. Um, I've got a request from Councillor Allen to speak. I'll keep it brief, Chair, because I'm sure everyone's getting a, a little bit fed up with talking of trees. but. Can I ask if the tree is planted uh, the first condition, does that cover it in the second or does he have to plant two if he does both? He does have to plant two if he does both. Thanks. Councillor Levitt. Um, I don't think anybody's seconded it yet, actually. So I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I'm happy to second. To well spotted, and thank you for that. Uh, I'm happy to second. Uh, and regarding the tree, I think, as you said, uh, uh, Chairman, that spec not specifying a particular uh, brand of tree or type of tree is a good idea because I know from experience when I felled some trees in my garden, uh, and I did replace them, um, I couldn't replace it with the same type because of you can't put the same one in the same hole or something. There's, there's, there's some. Uh, there's some arborological reason why you can't always do that. So I think uh, a native tree is a, is a good compromise. Yeah, I agree. So we have a proposer and a seconder and no amendments. So I think we can go to the vote on that. I beg your pardon, Councillor Allen. We make sure it's amended so we can plant the tree in the back garden, not the front, rather than having to have two trees of that size in the front garden, only if there's one in the front garden. Okay. Tom, sorry, a point I just made um, in response to Council Bloxham is, if that were to happen and they didn't build the first permission that you just voted on, you end up with no tree in the front garden, but you would end up in the back garden. And as I explained previously, I think the front garden is where the visual amenity is more sensitive. Well, Alistair. Uh, so to to be clarify, uh, Councillor Allen did say if there is already a tree planted in the front garden, then they could put it at the second one in the back, but only at that point. <laughs> and on the order in which they built the extensions. Mm. If I may, I, I would suggest it's. Uh, Yes, it's slightly unruly, but I think it's probably what we have on the table is the best solution. Okay. 
I think we're going to go to the vote on this. No, you can't. Um, James, can we vote on this now, please? Chair, this motion is carried. Thank you very much. Um, we turn to agenda item 10 now, planning appeals over to Tom Allington to present. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we have, uh, I think it's a total of five appeal decisions to report back to um, councillors. Um, may I be so bold as to suggest four of them are not hugely noteworthy. However, the first one is. Um, councillors probably remember um, the site at Croft Lane, Cashio Lane in Letchworth, which is one of our alloc now allocated housing sites. Um, that was recommended for approval by the officer um, and it was overturned and refused by committee on the grounds of um, the basically I think it was Croft Lane was too narrow for the sort of level of traffic in essence I obviously summarize um, the appeal was dismissed um, however it was the inspector found that the reason given by the council was actually acceptable in their view they considered that the 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 impact of the traffic would be of an acceptable level. It, having discussed it internally, and being honest and frank, shall we say, it's a slightly odd dismissed appeal. It was dismissed because the um, obligations in the unilateral undertaking had not been fully justified and therefore had not been found to be fully SIL compliant. Um, the, yeah, the council failed to provide a, a full and proper SIL compliance statement as part of the appeal. When asked for one, the, the officer went back and referred to the officer's report, but the inspector decided that that wasn't sufficient justification and refused it on for that reason. Oh, sorry, dis dismissed it for that reason. As I say, it is quite unusual. Um, the only thing I would add is we do have another application for the same site currently live and is likely to come to committee in the coming months. Um, like I say, there are four other, um, were there any questions or any, any clarification wanted on that appeal decision? Um, as I say, uh, the other uh, appeal decisions aren't hugely noteworthy, unless anybody wants to raise any of them or ask any questions about them, I'm happy to discuss. In which case, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. And that is the end of our business for this evening. And the meeting is closed. Next meeting is on the 1st of December.